Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Boa tarde. Totihi Wakopema. I'm Bruno Carvalho. Bruno Carvalho recently arrived um, faculty here at Harvard and one of the co-organizers of the conference. Thank you all for being here, for following online, and welcome to the session on imagining and creating futures. At our universities and elsewhere, we increasingly speak of innovation and solutions-based approaches to the challenges of climate change, as we must. At the same time, we also need to acknowledge that not all answers lie among us. Peoples of the forest have lived sustainably for much longer than our own civilizational models. We know that demarcating and protecting indigenous territories is a most effective way to curb illegal mining and deforestation. Today, in Brazil, indigenous rights and indigenous lives are under severe attack. Those that think that it's impossible for us to make a transition to sustainable bioeconomies or that it's unviable to keep our forests standing and our rivers flowing should probably think again. What's unviable is our planet without the Amazon forest. It's not practical to go on with business as usual. It's not pragmatic to ignore the realities of climate change or the material limits of the planet as our models of development often do. That should be the starting point of, of serious conversations. To create new futures, we will need multiple approaches and all willing hands on deck, from our universities to the Yanomami. And I realize that um, all this might be preaching to the choir, but as we know, the choir needs practice. <laughs> and as we work to imagine and bring into being different ways of making our increasingly urban societies function, and of finding meaning in the world, we need our innovators, our researchers, our dreamers, and we need to support the peoples of the forest and learn with them. Today we are honored to have among us one of the most vital voices in defense of Amazonia, Davi Kopenawa Yanomami. Before saying a few more words about him, I'll introduce Eldir Perri Ferreira, who will come to the stage and translate from Yanomami. Elder received a PhD in linguistics from Radboud University in the Netherlands. He's the organizer of a Yanomami Portuguese dictionary and now works at ISA, the Instituto Socioambiental, Socio Environmental Institute, a leading NGO who works closely with Hutukara Yanomami Association, um, founded by Davi and others in 2004. Elder, Davi, and our friends at ISA asked us to show a brief video of their latest campaign. We are here and have been for thousands of years. And despite everything, we continue determined and strong, standing firm. You can pretend you aren't bothered, that you aren't looking. But we're here, fighting for a long time. And now, more than ever, fighting against the clock. If there's any diversity left in the forest, it's thanks to us. If there's rainfall in the city or the countryside, it's also thanks to us. If medicine has somewhere to look for new cures, it's because we're here. But we can't go on being ignored, spending our lives being pushed out of the way. That's why we're going to keep on resisting, determined, standing firm. Because we are the forest. And the forest is us. Yo queria massa, sane. Uri teria maka, rai chaprema drk. A tatakupuka, a 
macho. Nem o para que comer. E a floresta somos nós. Davi, Copenhague took a very long time to get from uh, there, from the forest to here, and, and not only for the usual reasons. Him and Eldir spent the last two days amid several flight cancellations due to weather, broken aircraft, delayed immigration in, in Miami. But he is here now, as he has been for many years, leading the fight for Yanomami land rights and for our planet's welfare. His given last name, Copenhague, Hornet in Yanomami reflects his tenacity and courage. Davi was born in 1956 in Kashibi, now known as Maracanã, a Yanomami community of the upper Tutotobi River in the state of Amazonas. When he was a child, first contacts with Brazilian government officials and North American missionaries brought fatal diseases and many in his community died. In the 1980s, Davi began working for the Fundação Nacional do Índio, the FUNAI, as an intermediary between the government and indigenous peoples with little or no contact to outsiders. Since the invasions of Yanomami territory in the 1980s by illegal gold miners, Davi has worked for the protection of the forest. Back then, his actions resulted in death threats. This is happening again. After a major international campaign in the late 80s and the 90s, led by Yanomami, by Survival International, and the Comissão Pro Yanomami, the Brazilian government recognized their land rights in 1992. Covering over 9.6 million hectares, it is one of the planet's most significant reservoirs of biodiversity, as well as home to over 25,000 Yanomami. Davi has worked with NGOs on innovative bilingual education, aiming to help the Yanomami defend their rights, and setting up the NGO Urihi, which means forest, which trained Yanomami health workers and successfully reduced rates of malaria and other infectious diseases. He has received numerous awards for his efforts, including from the UN and the Bartolomé de las Casas Prize in Spain. With anthropologist Bruce Albert, he is author of The Falling Sky, published by Harvard University Press in 2013, which brings together a moving first-person account of Davi's story, a reflection on Yanomami culture and cosmology, including shamanic visions, and a haunting critique of the world we've built. It is a book that leaves no readers unchanged. It wasn't easy for Davi Kopenawa to join us. Thank you all who made it possible, and I can't imagine a greater honor than introducing him. So please join me in giving him a very, very warm welcome. Ipa repara, wahuiman. Posso falar em língua Yanomami? Pei na baba. Vocês, vocês brancos, escutem o que eu vou falar. Rapana, Caminhão rapa raio para Mubaru. Caminhão Davi Copenau e Anomami. Urihi Urihi no Amatema. E Anomai tem por uma bubihui. E até a Renimão Bihion Kahomaka. Vocês é, aqui tem muitas autoridades, muitas pessoas importantes aqui. E eu quero falar o seguinte, é, mas antes eu preciso me apresentar, eu sou Davi Copenal, eu sou lutador, é, é, defensor da floresta, eu luto pela saúde do Zianomami e eu, eu quero falar o seguinte. Pataba, o Editorra, Yanomai, Anuncia muda, o macbico não mãe. Caminha macuri ribaham, Brasil a uri ribaham. 
kami ama kia hi bu ha mathe yai to de hita mi yaro e na bu pata mu e na bu pata mo re bu an wa mare ke ya bu ka yaro wa mare ke wa ya ma yaro e ya thani ya bu am ka ho ma ke ha bom é o seguinte é, vocês talvez se perguntem por que que eu tô aqui falando é, fazendo essas demandas que eu, que eu vou fazer, vocês autoridades, que, por que, que eu estou fazendo essas demandas? É, não, não pense que eu estou fazendo à toa, não. Porque lá na minha terra, lá na minha, na minha casa, as coisas não estão não nada bem. Não estão não tão nada bem. Renato Coelho, foi do Rio Mamma Uri Mamma Puria Poca do Ayalo. Wamana Tablaimi. The Uri hit of the Hu, Wamak Biko no Mai. Way the I I Napa Pata Morewa. But Oakola Yomayalo. Way the the Damo Hoshima. Kami Yamakuri Bum. Vocês aqui de longe, vocês talvez olhem a floresta e achem que está tudo bem, a floresta está de longe, ela parece bonita, mas é, para quem está ali dentro, uh, não, 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 não estão, as coisas não estão boas, não. E principalmente porque agora é, chegou um novo presidente é, que não está prometendo coisas muito boas. Perde aí. Na bopata moreu. Dois mundos. E uma capuri de ramo. Cama na boba rua maiorra. Indígena Brasileiro teria uma que o Ibrahim passa na rua Yoti, todo dia tem a Henry Maime, o Ibrahim o Aya Matema, o Ibrahim Mashida Ham teve tuai Ibrahim, Ma Mashib e Ma Mashib Aui, e teve a Pata Morewa. Governo Bra Governo Bata Morewe Anhoi Anhoi to de him aqui Ai to de him Anhoi to de Ibrahim Hoshimi tra shan hayu mate ku yalo ka mi amak yai pata hishio na bo bosha e uri tari amak je yamak to blaru buri ai mi bon eh os 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 Nababa, os não indígenas, vivem em um mundo diferente. Nós, povos da floresta, nós andamos na floresta e os, os Nababa muitas vezes não, não, não escutam o que está acontecendo na, na floresta. É, Agora o, o presidente às vezes diz coisas boas, às vezes e muitas vezes diz coisas muito ruins, é, principalmente sobre os aqueles não indígenas que vão é, retirar minérios, é, vão cavar a terra em nossa floresta para tirar minérios. É, ele fala, ele fala como que apoiando essas pessoas, e isso não está não nada bem. Nós, com, a, com, com essas pessoas trabalhando na floresta, retirando, a, cavocando a, a, a terra, nós não vamos viver bem e vocês não vão viver bem também, não. Não está? Bem, empataba. Rabana caminha e aí o alto com o birril. Eu quero. E a Royamu birril em mim. Royamu e caminha e rato com a em mim. 
kau pada omak yang mak tayar. Kami ayat pesi mau mawi. Anak beban terhabat tablarihi mineralsaun, mineralsaun terkaki. Kami ane ipohi anu maya makan, pohi anu mami jekuan, pohi dijno brasileru yang makan eh yang mat pesi mai mi. Então, eu vou falar claramente aqui e não vou ficar me escondendo. É o que, é, 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 isso é o que nós queremos, nós, povos indígenas. Ou melhor, o que nós não queremos. Nós não queremos mineração em nossa terra. E eu falo isso pelos Yanomamis e pelos Yekuana e pelos outros povos da floresta. Aitã, mineração Ana. Udah betul deh begitu, orang teri yang makan. Minera sawan, sawal, wajib teri mui, urih wari mui, mau syami mui, yalo nama mui, eh itu soalnya waru maki yalo, eh ya tengah wujud bihom. Me digam vocês o que que a mineração traz de bom, o que que ela traz de bom. Ela só traz, é, só suja a água, só traz doença, só traz conflito social. É... Por isso, não tem por que é, defender isso. É, se nós simplesmente não queremos isso. É isso aí. Kamiano mak bulai, hoi teri wamak, hoi ha, hoi ya urihia wamak pelire, wamak tamu kohi biaro, kah wamak kah hoi kohi biaro, na bu apa tamu ini, minerasau ania tayui wamak wasu. Vocês, vocês que vivem aqui nessa cidade que parece tão bonita, vocês são tão, parecem tão poderosos, vocês é, nos ajudem e digam a, 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 as, a, as autoridades para que proíbam a mineração em terra indígena. Ana, caminha cubriu mineração ano, caminha macarra. O tipo de benefício bom para o Yanomami e o Ana, que tem o Itaku Aimi, que é o Amolocação, Amolocação Terra Yanomami. O presidente do Brasil, Ana, a Uri, com a Riquimá que é o Yaro, que é o Yama Kene, e a Uri não é mais. E carro a maquixa. Então, não há benefício pra, da mineração para os Yanomami e para os Iekuana. É, portanto. Não benefício a mim, Yaro. Não vai trazer benefício para o povo Yanomami. Homologação. Só vai trazer a doença. Morte, problema, pobreza do rio, isso aqui vai trazer. E, e também um, não vai trazer benefício para o meu povo Yanomami. O que, que o governo vai dar? Será que vai dar a nossa terra de volta? Isso aqui eu queria, isso aqui eu falei. A homologação já existe também, o presidente já homologou a terra indígena e, portanto, não tem por que é, haver, do, haver garimpeiros na, na terra indígena. Então, eu defendo a terra e espero que vocês defendam junto comigo. Foi isso que ele disse também. Aí tá. Municipalizar. Municipalização municipalizada a saúde e a Caminhando aí, já tem que ser mais municipalizado. Saúde, a cua riquia, toda a riquia. Município urbano, caminhando mais, o amor é que está aí, me alô, e caminhando mais, e a mata piquia aí. 
E também nós não queremos que a saúde indígena seja municipalizada, seja passada a responsabilidade para os municípios do Brasil. Nós, nós não conhecemos as pessoas que são os prefeitos, as pessoas que trabalham nessas prefeituras, e essas pessoas não nos conhecem também. Caminhamacana, prefeito de Yamataime. Caminhamacana, Uri Hiptaime. Caminhamacana, Buri Akutarena. Município, município, Hamu Apatamui. Caminhamacana, Yai Taime, Yaro. Anaku Dayan. Caminha, Bihilaime. Awe Totiwa Taki, Caminha Kuimi. Late <laughs> Pois é, os prefeitos não nos conhecem, nós não conhecemos os prefeitos, é, e, portanto, se nós, se os, se os nós lideranças de Anomami, é, se, se, se os conselheiros de Anomami não disserem, é, vamos lá, faça isso, faça a municipalização da saúde, então a, a, não deve haver essa municipalização, a saúde não deve ir para os municípios. E eu nós, eu vou, vou, vou lutar por, por isso, para que ela não vá, e espero que vocês nos ajudem também aqui, não permitir que isso aconteça. Aí está com Urihi Waisiba Maui, Kamiyamaku, território Yamaku, Molocação, Kuahiki Brari Mamaki, foi tudo é presidente Bolsonaro Ana. O Amareco Urihi Briaca, o Aiciba Maui, e Camiana, e a Noma Yamakan e a Marpre Bechimaimi. Um outro assunto, um outro assunto é a diminuição das terras indígenas que o atual presidente é, tem prometido. Isso a gente não quer também de jeito nenhum. A diminuição da terra indígena, a terra indígena já está demarcada e não tem por que diminuí-la. E a lei federal, a gente vai fazer uma coisa que é 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 uma coisa Brasil é uma coisa que é uma coisa que é uma coisa que é a nossa demarcação da terra já está, na, já, já existe uma lei demarcando essa terra. É, não tem por que voltar atrás. Os, os não indígenas não estão carentes, não, não, vão, não vai faltar terra para os não indígenas. O governo brasileiro tem muita terra, o Brasil tem muita terra. É, não tem por que ficar olhando para a nossa terra, para a terra indígena. E a gente não quer mais que a terra indígena seja é, destruída. Aí tem... Tem... Caminhamakeha. Caminhamakeha. Governo Federal Ano. A saúde de Yaiha, o Amarek, Pai de Brahimão, Pai de Brahimiaro. O Amarek, Pai de Brahimão, aí a Mac Noman, e Hirupa Noman Shoa, e a Mac Puria Kutarena, Shawara Waiku Ayaro, malária, gripe, tuberculose, câncer e sarampo. É nada Waiku Ayaro. Waiter in Wamakan, Pata Wamanuatari, Kami Wamanek Yai, Wamanek Yai, Pairi Blab, Kamadeve, Ekuayaro. Outro assunto, voltando à saúde, é 
que ela não está nada bem, a, o atendimento à saúde. Não, é, a gente não tem recebido ajuda. Tem ainda muitos casos de malária, de sarampo, de gripe, de tuberculose, de câncer. É, por, simplesmente porque o governo não tem cumprido com o seu dever. Vocês, vocês têm que nos ajudar a, a, a mandar, a demandar dos seus, do, do, das autoridades que nos ajudem a, 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 for, a fornecer uma saúde decente, que é a obrigação do Estado brasileiro. Então, aí tem um receba parceiro. Passeiro para aqui, o amarek para ir para lá, o amarek não amanhã para lá, o Instituto Social Apietão, o amarek, o amarek para ir lá. E aí, caminho, o amarek, o amarek para ir para lá, o amarek para ir para lá, o governo do governo Bolsonaro, a Roya Rida, a Rony Blamanida, o Itibeni Amarek. É, um outro assunto é, que me preocupa são, é com relação aos nossos apoiadores, as pessoas que apoiam, apoiam a causa Yanomami, como o Instituto Socioambiental, e que o novo governo tem é, querido... Tem, 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 é, tem, tem deixado, tem sufocado, tem, está querendo é, deixar é, carente, sem recursos. Né? E isso me preocupa muito, porque se essas pessoas ficarem sem recursos, se elas é, ficarem carentes, né? ficarem sem recursos, como que vão, vão, vão continuar a nos ajudar? Aí tem... Fundação Nacional do, da FUNAI, caminha a Macumba, caminha a Iru de Rã, a Mareca, Heru a Maui, a Maquia, a Canha, a Uditiblarium, cama, cama ruim, presidente a Patamuína, a Uditiblamana Melhor, caminha a Maca, Pai de Blaiwit Kuaim. Aí, por isso, eu me plano, pois aí, a FUNAI, a Ramapla Marana, aí, ministro, a Yanomai Yamak, no Himang Maui, a Norte Maki Mayaro, e te a Kamiya Kanshuhurua. Um outro assunto, outra questão é a FUNAI, é, que o novo presidente é, enfraqueceu, quase é, quis acabar mas enfraqueceu e colocou num lugar uma pessoa que, que simplesmente não é amiga dos Yanomamis ou, ou do, dos povos indígenas, com quem os povos indígenas não têm uma, uma, uma relação ótima. E isso nos preocupa, porque a FUNAI é uma instituição do governo de que, quer dizer, que deveria cuidar da gente. Nós... Davi disse, nós somos filhos da FUNAI, a FUNAI é o nosso, é o, é o nosso pai que deveria estar é, tá olhando pela gente, mas esse novo governo enfraqueceu a FUNAI e isso me preocupa bastante. Bem, ei, Ana Camila Kubihilma, Kawa makha, tuwa mak, patawa mak, makowa mak. Hoyama, hoy yaiham, kamia waroke mayana ya bihito blaru. Nana bo amaku, mosionado amaku, mak bihito blaru de. Anaya, wai sipku bihum, ta makem hoya. Bom, essas eram as poucas palavras que eu queria colocar aqui para vocês. 
é, vocês mulheres, homens, senhores, senhoras, é, estou muito emocionado de tá, estar de, de tá aqui nessa casa, como vocês falam, né? emocionado, eu estou emocionado e estou feliz de estar tá aqui falando essas coisas, era apenas isso que eu gostaria de colocar para vocês. Então, um abraço obrigado. Então, eu vou explicar para vocês que eu falei... Yanomami, é, muita gente, brasileiro, estrangeiro, americano e os outros, sempre fala para o povo indígena. É, ele fica criticando que não existe, não existe mais Yanomami de verdade, não fala própria língua, não, não pensa a própria língua indígena, a sociedade não indígena sempre fala isso. É por isso que eu falei a ah, Yanomami, para você entender, para você entender e entender, pensar qual língua que o Yanomami fala. É assim, o governo... Dois mundos, o governo não considera com indígena como amigo, até hoje. É por isso que vocês não interessam aprender nossa língua para ser assim, amigo, para ser amigo, falando, conversando, é trocando a ideia. Então, o que eu falei, a Yanomami. Então, eu fiquei muito contente que vocês estão aqui, é, lugar muito longe, que eu cheguei aqui para contar a situação do meu povo Yanomami, a situação da a Amazônia real, que está é, sempre, sempre sofrendo. Sociedade não indígena, fazendeiros, é, madeireiros, e a, trabalhadores rurais sempre fica derrubando as, as florestas. Tudo isso que eles não estão enfrentando. Mas eu continuo a é, enfrentar grande alma da terra onde nós estamos morando. Aqui dois mundos e mundo brasileiro. Então, eu falei Yanomami que eu nem falei assim, ticando. Como é que você se tingando? Você sempre fala, né? Então, para aprender a língua do outro é difícil. Eu fiquei, é, eu fiquei assim, sofrendo para aprender a sua língua portuguesa. Então, agora, isso aqui eu falei um pouquinho em Yanomami. Oi, Renan Obrigado. I will now bring Andrew Revnik, who will introduce the other three speakers, and Davi uh, and Elde will join them for the Q&A after the next three talks. Andrew, for those that don't already know him, is one of America's most honored writers on environmental sustainability, sustainability and the role of communication innovation in fostering progress on a finite fast forward. Noisy planet. <laughs> 2018, he joined National Geographic Society to help expand support and grants for global sustainability focused journalism. This move followed three decades of groundbreaking journalism, um, including several years at the New York Times. He began writing on climate change in the 1980s and never stopped. Revkin has won several of the most important awards in science journalism. 
He's written acclaimed books on humanity's weather and climate learning journey, global warming, the changing Arctic and the assault on the Amazon forest, including his book on Shukumenges, which many of us know and which became an HBO movie in 1994 called The Burning Season. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, we got him. I'm going to do really quick, um, a really quick introduction. I mean, it's an unbelievable honor to follow such eloquence. It's impossible to follow such eloquence. Um, and part of the message, I think, in Davi's statement from the, the standpoint of the people's on a landscape that it has other values to the wider world, it's not just that they're guardians of some precious thing for us. It's, this, is their, this is a home for people. And that's a key part of the message going forward. The discussion this afternoon is on imagining and creating futures, which is, you know, journalism has not been very good at that. We tend to focus on things that happened. Today, we rarely focus in journalism on things that are going to affect the world on long time scales like climate, biodiversity loss. And that's one of the challenges, one of the frontiers that I think we can attack in this room together as scientists, scholars, journalists, peoples, communities on the ground, is new ways to share and shape information that can make progress, despite the noise and the polarization and the rest. Um, and one thing that has humbled me, I spent most of my time as a science writer, science journalist. Uh, it was when I started writing about the story of Chico Mendez. I spent four months in the Amazon uh, before the internet in 1989 and all this stuff. And, um, I, that was the first time I really integrated in my own thinking as a journalist that what we think of as environmental problems are societal issues that have environmental symptoms. And uh, the burning of the Amazon is a reflection of clashing visions of the future of a place. The ranchers I met use the word limpar. You know, the, those of you who speak Spanish or Portuguese know that, to clean. Their job, they were the banderantes, they're the pioneers cleaning the landscape of the Amazon and the people I met in the forest, including Indian communities and Serengueros, their passion was, no, this is our, our value set. We want to sustain this, this ecosystem that we live in. So it's like, that was really important as a journalist. And then coming forward in time, I began to realize much more when I stopped writing about climate science itself so much and wrote more about social sciences, behavioral sciences and went to the Vatican to meetings, not just to uh, universities, as the values mattered so much more than data, usually. And uh, reflexes and values shape what we do much more than some new infographic I can show you. So that means, again, this is not simple, but it also means that it takes a multi-dimensional approach to make progress. It's, it's, it's visualizers, artists, communities on the ground, uh, institutions, fostering communities' capacity to tell their own story. The old model was me with my pad, coming and interviewing you all, and telling you your story back to you. Like, that's so 20th century. I mean, it's so 19th century. So, uh, and the hard thing is that this information ecosystem that surrounds us, which is changing, the only thing changing faster than the biogeophysical environment is the communication environment. There's no new norms. That stationary is absolutely dead. If you've probably seen this, the physical or earth scientists know about stationarity, that's where you assume your models going forward are based on what you knew about the world until now. Well, that's all over. So that, that's what we'll discuss here. Pathways to progress, they won't be some journalist telling a better story. It won't be some scientist making a better discovery. It won't be a community staking its claim in a discussion. It will be all of those things. So let's uh, get started. Uh, my panelists can come forward to the, to the podium here, and we'll, we'll get going. And we have a, a great collection of people uh, to, to kind of paint this new picture. Um, here's Luis uh, Gilberto Murillo, who is, um, it's, so it's so simplistic to describe you as a former minister of the environment, because he has had uh, education in mining and engineering, 
experience uh, as, a, as a hostage, I mean, a kidnapped victim. <laughs> All kinds of un amazing turns in your life. And at, in your 20s, you started out focusing on environmental sustainability in the state of Chaco, uh, so in Colombia. So, but that's just scratching the surface. Um, we have a great reporter, a great journalist here, Eliana Broom. Come, come on up. Uh, who's really, uh, is there any journalist in Brazil who's gotten more awards? I don't know, maybe, maybe. Uh, just tr track her columns in El País on, on the current events. She splits her time between Altamira and that southern part of Brazil, which is uh, where most Brazilians are. And being in Altamira must be an experience, just, just that one thing. As Marcelo um, Salazar described to me, it's within a circular radius of Altamira. You've got dams, you've got mining, you've got deforestation, you've got indigenous communities doing sustainable harvests. So, that's like a universe in itself. And finally, uh, Augusto Zampini Davies. I assume he's here somewhere. Oh, yeah, good. We were just talking. Who um, has a master's degree in well-being. I love that. We should all have that education. <laughs> and human development. Uh, but he's, he's uh, with the Vatican and uh, pursuing... Um, I have to find out what a dicastery is. You could explain. A ministry. A ministry, a di dicastery. But, but his, uh, his whole approach is uh, focused on, on this idea of integral human development. And that is where we're at. We're, at this, we're, we're integrating. So let's just get going. I'm going to sit down, and then each of you will come up to do your presentation briefly, and we'll get started. David said it's very difficult to speak your language. That's what I will try. <laughs> and uh, what I may say after his very uh, touching and wise uh, remark. Uh, it's, it's very d difficult to say something. I, when you come to uh, Harvard, you try to put data, and you don't have data, but you have story of life. So it's very, sometimes very difficult. So I will try to, uh, to uh, present something here. But first, uh, let me uh, express my deep respect for David Kopenawa and his life and his work and his leadership uh, because he's a role model for all of us. We need to hear more, more voices like, like his. And uh, I'm, I'm very delighted to be here to share. The only thing that I will share is my, my experience as a, as a policymaker, environmental policymaker in Colombia. And also my experience of somebody who was born in Chocó, in the deep forest of the biographical Chocó, the uh, super humid rainforest. And uh, I, was, I was there until uh, I have 17 years old. Uh, and then I went to, uh, to a foreign country to study, and it was the first time I see a city. So, uh, have been a, a quiet journey. So, uh, this is why I wanted to uh, to thank all the organizers and my friends here for uh, this invitation. And also, I I would like to share with you that uh, I was. Uh, very honored to hear the presentation of Professor Wilson, because former President Santos shared with me that I need to hear Professor Wilson. And I said, why? I have read some of, of his uh, articles. He said, you know what? Long time ago, uh, I can say that I, my commitment to biodiversity conservation and to bioeconomy, because we were talking about bioeconomy, uh, was because of a conversation with him when he was here at Harvard. So I was very uh, excited when I, I hear that you will be presenting today. I'm very, I feel really honored to uh, uh, hear your, your conversations and to read part of the, your last book that was shared with us. Uh, I really want to talk about some propositions that 
maybe for scientists like you, sounds very evident, but not for the entire public that creates public opinion and public will. And uh, my first proposition is that Colombia is a treasure of biodiversity and traditional culture that create, recreate, and protect it. As David Copenawa in Brazil, all the Quilombolas in Brazil, or the Afro-Colombians. It sounds like evident, but it is not evident. Because as he said, we have problems at home, maybe in Colombia too, with the conflicting relationship with the indigenous community and the government. Or with what happened to one of the recipient of the Environmental Goldman Prize, Francia Marquez, that uh, some illegal criminal networks tried to kill her because she's defending, she's an Afro Colombian leader, the most influential leader in Colombia, and she's defending the rivers and, and defending the environment and, and demanding rights for her community against illegal mining. I will not go through this, you know this, that Colombia is the second most biodiverse country in the world, second to Brazil. Uh, this is our position in a, to pass, our position in a, in a global contest. And as Professor Wilson said this morning, you have to focus on nature and biodiversity conservation if you want to respond to the challenge of climate change. It's not only a matter of technology, engineering. It's also related to protecting the nature and its culture. The second proposition I have is obviously there is a risk. Colombia is a case for that. Degradation is a huge problem. And also that limits our possibilities to adapt to climate change. As Brigitte Batiste, who is here, director of the uh, National Institute of Biodiversity in Colombia, uh, said that the most effective way to, to adapt to climate change is to have ecosystem, natural ecosystem in good shape, in good health. And people in those ecosystems in good health. Uh, and I, I want to show some of the, this is what we are confronting. This is the scenario for uh, 2100. This is the scenario that Colombia is confronting. Uh, this is a data from the Institute that Brigitte lead and also the Institute for Environmental Studies and Meteorology of Colombia, IDEAM. And you see, we can move, if nothing's done, to increase of three gallons Celsius temperature in Colombia. You see the Amazon, you see the Caribbean part of Colombia. And also look at the precipitation. And we are talking about Chocó, for example, when I was born, we have between 10 and 12 millimeters of drain a year. Imagine an increase in 10, 20%. It's a disaster. Keeping in mind, obviously, the bad shape of our ecosystems. The challenge of deforestation, a huge challenge. We, we did everything we could to stop deforestation, but it was, it's a tremendous challenge. There are global factors, there are national factors, regional factors that are moving colonization into very valuable, ecosystems that are the base for a new economy, for an economy that should be sustainable. That's the situation we are confronting now. And the main cause of deforestation is land grabbing. That's the main cost. And many of the rural communities that are in those lands don't have the title to the land. And we tried with President Santos to approve a law 
to grant in certain areas of the agricultural frontier land for uh, rural communities within the framework of the peace agreement. And the Congress didn't pass it because of political gains. And you see the, the correlation between environment conflict and peace. That's why the priority of President Santum was peace. And we created one narrative for, for, for people to know that narrative and to appropriate that narrative was we need to make peace between us, but also peace and reconciliation with the environment and the nature. And even some people criticize us now, saying, oh, that narrative, but that's creating future. That's putting a dream in the minds of people, because that is possible. And you see where you have uh, pressure for deforestation, also you have intense activity of illegal armed actors. 70% of deforestation occurs in Colombia in areas where the conflict is intense. Uh, and this is the picture you can see. Most of the emissions in Colombia is by sectors of the economy. Agriculture and forestry are obviously the bigger emitter of uh, greenhouse gases in Colombia, although Colombia is not the uh, big emitter of greenhouse gases. That is increasing, but it's not. So we depend on you to decrease your emissions. And there is a, there is a huge ethical question, ethical question on equity and equality. Uh, and this is the goal. Obviously, Colombia share the vision of the international community to have uh, an economy that is neutral in terms of carbon emissions. We introduce a national carbon tax. We are waiting for the United States to introduce it too. Uh, and also we created a mechanism for uh, carbon neutrality. Companies can choose to pay that tax to the government or invest in protecting biodiversity. Calculate, obviously, the avoided emission because they avoid deforestation, and that create development, appropriate development for those communities. So that's a good mechanism. I think that Colombia is, is the only country that have that kind of mechanism, I think. My third proposition is more about the vision. We need to create a vision that can be communicated in a compelling way. In a compelling way. I know it's very important to have a vision that is based on research and evidence, but sometimes we are not very good at communicating those results of the research. So need to be compelling. This is what we tried and, 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 and intending to do. And also, that vision need to be connected to the culture that really are associated with protecting biodiversity and the nature. And it needs some kind of paradigm shift, not only in the vision of development, but also it is political in terms of changing the power relations. David Copenhagen was saying here, there is a president uh, and some uh, public officials that are, that are making decisions that is affecting its people. And he's, he, he, he has very, very few tools to respond to that. So that's a huge problem. Society cannot move in that way towards sustainability. This is what we did with President Santos. We said, we need to send a strong message that this is about protecting areas that are very important and strategic from the, uh, uh, in terms of biodiversity and the natural resources. So uh, in his administration, the government went from 
30 million hectares of protected areas, uh, the most restricted one, to 31 million. And also, he started preaching and forced us, all of us, to do the same in terms of the importance of the moorlands or paramos. Colombia has 50 percent of this, kind, of this kind of high mountain ecosystem that we call the factory of water. That was the narrative that we created. So people start like talking more in the public debate about this kind of ecosystem beyond, beyond the, the, the uh, scientific community, both national and international, beyond. And people start correlating the importance of those ecosystems with the water that they really use. So we, uh, with the support of, again, of the, of the team of uh, Brigitte Batiste, we, we demarcated those ecosystems. But we're creating a fact. Some people say, why demarcating those ecosystems if that's only a paper? Well, it's not a paper. It's creating future. From a pragmatic point of view. Also, and you see, you see the result, we went almost to 43 million hectares in different kind of strategy of conservation. That was a main priority of the government. Now, the challenge is to consolidate this because we have tremendous problem of enforcing those decisions because of different factors, including uh, security and illegal activities. This is, then, I, I wanted to highlight uh, the increase, the expanding protected areas in the, in, in the marine ecosystem. We went from 1.2 million hectares to 13 million hectares. Uh, and the role of, of uh, ethnic minorities and indigenous communities and Afro-Colombians. As you see, 32 natural protected areas uh, um, have coincided with uh, uh, collective territories of these communities. We have 82 indigenous uh, uh, ethnic groups, uh, the same number of languages, um, 40 Afro-Colombian uh, community councils, like, like uh, regional community councils, and three distinct Afro-Colombian uh, uh, um, ethnic groups with particularities. And 49% of the natural forest is owned by indigenous and Afro-Colombian communities. And you can add 3% of rural communities. So more than 50% of natural forest really is owned by these communities. And this is where I are located, as you can see. Mainly in the south of the country, in the Amazon basin, the Amazonia and also in the Pacific coast when I came from. And this is in the Amazon, as you see, almost, uh, we have 13 protected areas in the Amazon, almost uh, 46 million uh, hectares, 169 indigenous uh, reservations. And it is 40% of the Colombian territory and 6% of the Great Amazonia but very important for the country. And I want to show you and, and, and to mention this exercise that we did uh, in Colombia to expand the, Ch the Chiribiquete National Park, which is a, a, a world heritage of the UNESCO. And the list that you see there are all the factors and actors that you need to align in order to expand uh, 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 any protected area in the country. Chiriquete went from 1.2 million hectares to 2.7 million hectares, and then we end, end up uh, last year in 4.3 million hectares. And you have first to align the Ministry of Mine and Energy. We have this, the so-called uh, cooperation agreement between, between ministries that you cannot expand a protected area if you don't have the agreement of the mining 
and Energy Ministry and the National uh, Oil Agency and the Mining Agency. So this is a tremendous work. But in addition to that, all the consultation with uh, ethnic uh, minority groups, indigenous communities, the work that scientists need to do. And something that is critical is the role of uh, technical NGOs like WWS or, w, or WWS or CI, all these international organizations and some national organizations and foundations play a key role in providing technical assistance to expand these uh, uh, protected areas. And my fourth proposition is uh, what I have, have been saying. You need to have a vision, communicate that vision. You need to have some kind of shift in power, uh, particularly when it comes to um, rural communities and uh, indigenous and, uh, and ethnic minorities. And also, not have to rely on their on technical proposals that you consider are perfect, but then the processes can destroy them. And this is the vision. We had a vision. We said 40, 40 million hectares of Colombia have potential for uh, sustainable agriculture. 60 million have potential for uh, developing a different economy, for developing bioeconomy. Uh, based on, 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 on uh, biodiversity conservation and forest conservation, and some area of, sta of stabilization in the country, when you can stabilize the agricultural frontier. And this was the vision that we worked with President Santos and others to, for, the, for stopping uh, deforestation in the Amazon, like closing the agricultural frontier that was part of the peace agreement. First, to have these two areas for agroforestry and also some kind of buffer for uh, ecosystem services. And also define and clarify the property rights of uh, rural communities in those areas, in those areas, because our communities that are forced to go into the jungles. This was based on technical exercises that were done by the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Environment, and others. But we tried to create this in a very simple way that was possible for any Colombian to understand and support it, in terms of trying to create this vision of the, of the future. This is what I wanted to, to share with, with all of you. I have much to say, but uh, this is part of how, from a pragmatic way, you can really advance in creating a vision, communicating that vision, and really gaining some political will and political support to implement a new model of development that is really move, moving into a sustainable world that can respond to the challenge of climate change. Thank you very much. To, just to consider how, how valuable that message is, think about what Tasso was saying earlier today about having instant information available on deforestation patterns. And the question was, well, who do you connect that information with? So just uh, one of the distilling solutions things here, I think, just think about connecting data and voices from resource frontiers with audiences that can matter. But who are the audiences, et cetera? That leads, so just keep that thing in mind. That seems to be a part of what you were just describing. So the role of journalists is really important still, even though I was ex describing all of these other ways to communicate. Um, so it's your turn to present. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. I'm very happy to be wel welcome in Boston and also very happy that the president of my country is not welcome in New York <laughs> because, because of his racist, homophobic, misogynist comments and his support for torturers, dictators, and destroyers of the Amazon. I guarantee I will have a different message. 
In the Amazon forest, a large tree releases 1,000 liters of water into the atmosphere every day through transpiration. The entire forest releases 20 trillion liters of water into the atmosphere every 24 hours. The forest perspires and saves the planet every day. It's beautiful, just as lovely or maybe lovelier than a poem by Walt Whitman, a symphony by Beethoven, a painting, painting by Michelangelo. But now, around 20% of the forest has been destroyed and you are close to the tipping point. We're not talking about the distant future, about something we'll never see, but about something looming right over tomorrow. If deforestation isn't stopped, the forest will become a savanna. Without the Amazon forest, global warming cannot be contained. And unless we contain global warming, we are condemned to live on a hostile planet. Our species, which has always feared catastrophe, finally seems to have done it. We have become the catastrophe we feared. The forest is being destroyed to produce meat. It's been destroyed to produce soybeans to feed the meat. It's been destroyed by roads, railways, and power plants. It's been destroyed by large mining projects led by corporations from countries that make pretty speeches at climate debates, but contaminate the Amazon's rivers to extract ore. Along with the forest, the forest peoples are being murdered, the only ones who can teach us to live without destroying the planet. The humans who are the solution are being killed by the humans who are the problem. The far-right populists who now rule countries like Brazil and the United States are destroying and poss possi any possibility of a future in the name of a past that never existed. They fabricate pasts to shut out futures. They are climate deniers and history deniers too. Bolsonaro's Brazil is probably the most radical showcase for this experiment in the perversion of history, with proclamations that global warming is an international Marxist plot, or that Nazism is an invention of the left. But Brazil is hardly the only example. From Trumpism to Brexit, the present debate is leaving the question of the future behind, while focusing on pasts that never existed. It's crystal clear how much calculated insanity has been propagated by the far-right governments flourishing around the world. Neoliberalism is authorizing, authorizing a few to do grave damage to a world that belongs to many in its own name. Neoliberalism preaches the present continues, but there is something running deeper something that lets caricatures like Trump and Bolsonaro garner so much support among the crushed masses, among those who truly feel the present slipping out from under them. It has become, hard, it has become harder than ever before to imagine a future in which we can live, because tomorrow, for the first time, is an impending catastrophe not a potential catastrophe, like the Cold War and atom bomb, but a catastrophe unlikely to be averted, since it's almost certain the Earth's temperature will rise at least two degrees Celsius. Actually, we are now on course for three or four degrees Celsius. The subjective pro product of this feeling is that there is no future is the invention of pasts to which we might supposedly return. Pasts, again, that never exists. <laughs> the British voters who approved Brexit believe they can return to a glorious Britain, free of immigrants. White Middle America 
thinks Trump can give it back a country where blacks are passive, subordinates, and where every single thing was, like them, in its place, and where everyone could live knowing where everything's place was. Bolsonaro's voters deny or justify the torture and murders committed by agents of the Brazilian state under the dictatorship because they enjoy the illusion that they once lived in a country of order and safety and can go back to living there. The simplistic, <coughs> tensionless past never existed in any of this, these examples or in any of the other examples spreading around the world. But maybe when we face a challenge as great as the climate crisis, a false past and a made-up enemy provide a kind of comfort zone, safer than a real, inescapably harsh future. We are also dealing with this form of denial. Ours is an era of deniers, climate deniers, history deniers, political deniers. The tragedy is that the only way to avoid an even more horrendous future is precisely through politics. Only politics can architect a global effort that is grounded in our recognition of the reality shared by a species that must join forces across borders. Unfortunately, the only instrument capable of creating a possible future is precisely the one that pseudo-nationalisms on the right and also on the left, repudiate so vehemently. Without politi politics, we will be unable to shape the idea of a commons, to restore the future in our collective imagination. We must restore the commons, and this can only be accomplished through politics. The German philosopher Günther Anders said the invention of the atom bomb marked the moment when humanity created something with ramifications it could not imagine. Starting with the same idea, the Brazilian anthropologist Eduardo Viveiros de Castro went on to show how the climate crisis is likewise something humanity cannot imagine. We can understand the concept of subliminal things, of things so small we can't see or perceive them, perceive them. Things happening right now in every corner of this auditorium. auditorium. Phenomena our eyes can't capture. The climate crisis, on the other hand, is something so supraliminal, so big, that we can't see or perceive it. In this case, precisely because it is enormous. This too is denial. And understanding this kind of denial seems vital to me if you are to understand the resurgence of far-right populist governments around the globe. In my more than 30 years as a journalist, I've learned that when it comes to creating realities, subjectivity, is just as much of a determinant as objective facts, or more so. While you are busy churning out YouTube videos, images passed off as reality itself, as a kind of pure, reali pure reality or real truth, we forfeit our ability to perceive what we cannot see. We are also deniers of imagination, incapable of perceiving what exists but that we can see or post on YouTube. We've arrived at this crucial moment bloated with realities. We consume only one type of reality and we've grown fat on it. We're unable to grasp other realities because we deny imagination. Our denial of politics our denial of imagination and our denial of the climate crisis are intimately linked parts of the same phenomenon. Far-right populists like Bolsonaro are fabricators of realities. They don't create, they distort. They fabricate enemies, fears, facts, and thus destroy the possibility of the commons. 
They keep our brains in a state of constant fright, enervating our bodies and impeding thought. This is the life of a hostage who knows nothing but the reality his captor forces on him. Our imagination has been replaced by the perversion of imagination. What is the perversion of imagination? It's foisting of a truth, truth that has nothing to do with the other or the natural world. It's man cut off from the commons, not a creator of worlds, but a grave maker of worlds, because he turns himself into the whole world, a world that supposedly isn't affected even by natural loss. This man doesn't create community, he creates volu volu volume. I believe this disconnection accounts for why despots are voted into power, based not just on post-truth, but on self-truth. Truth becomes a personal choice. Truth is an individual choice, because nothing more connects us to what we can call the natural world, or to any community other than a sect. As you know, in politics, even believers must be atheists. Yet what despots, despots demand isn't reason but faith, affiliation by, by faith. The world needs to understand what Brazilian has become before it's too late. Bolsonaro's Brazil isn't simply another country that elected a far right president in a world where the most powerful nation is led by Donald Trump. It's not just a, the Latin version of governments like those in Hungary, Poland, Turkey, and even Italy in Europe, or the Philippines in Asia. Brazil is not just another peripheral nation with a pathetic leader. Brazil has become the apocalyptic vanguard that signals how radical this moment is, <laughs> a vanguard with the power to exacerbate the climate crisis at lightning speed and impact the entire planet. This disconnect human is someone who feels crushed and terrified too. The ferocity of his denial is proportionate to his terror. He feels the climate crisis in his bones, yet he can name, can't name it. Bolsonaro's election, election is a response to what we might call civilization's new discontent. Maybe people can't name the source of their discontent, of the panic attacks that dr drive them to dope themselves with tranquilizers and sleep only with the aid of sedatives. The average, average citizen might apply more familiar labels to the corrosion of their quality of life, air and water, to the incitement of hatred and the view that the other is a threat, their constant fear of contagion, the feeling they walk in quicksand, a climate that's no longer like the one from their childhood. But the name of this new discontent, discontent running through our realms of human experience is climate crisis. Bolsonaro was elected on his pledge to go back 50 years. 50 years ago, Brazil lived under a mil military dictatorship. It was also a time when science promised nothing but progress and delivered no bad news that might cons constrain an individual's life or a government's actions, like the news of global warming. It was also a time when white, heterosexual men held power and knew precisely who they were. were. They may have faced some resistance from minorities, but they still enjoyed absolute hegemo hegemony. We cannot comprehend the moment the world is now living through or what is happening in Brazil unless we understand that our culture wars are tightly bound up with hum humanity's need to say goodbye to 20th century illusions of power and face a planet made more hostile by human hand. 
The Bolsonaro administration promises a new era, a return to a time not only free of doubts and insecurity about the present and future, but also a free of doubts and uncertainty uncertainty about what a man is and what a woman is, or about who is in charge of the public sphere or of the family. All of these subjectivities are tied to the denial of our climate crisis. The new liberals in control of Brazil's economic area have a very clear idea of what they want and have already started opening the Amazon up to exploration and exploitation. Bolsonaro promised to turn the public land occupied by indigenous peoples into private land where mining and agribusiness concerns can't reap profits. The goal is to make more forests land available for capitalist speculation. The process is already underway and at a frightening pace. This is why government ideologues fabricate the idea that communism, a system never implement, implemented in Brazil and now largely irrelevant worldwide, is an imminent threat to Brazilians. The alleged international Marxist plot serves to justify turning the forest into a commodity. In this calculated fantasy, indigenous peoples who are the chief barrier to destruction of the Amazon are portrayed as a threat to national sovereignty. The deforestation rate for 2018 was the highest in a decade. The mere possibility that Bolsonaro might win had a liberating effect on the, for the foresters and inflamed violence in the forest. Bolsonaro's messianic capitalism is not stopped. Life on this planet will be much worse for everyone. The future, as something created and something imagined, is a dispute in the realm of politics. The future suggested by the climate crisis is a dystopia. It's brutally hard to conjugate life in the present when the idea of future is a dystopia. For life to be possible in the present, we must be able to imagine not only a future we, where we can live, but a little more, a future where we can, want to live. This isn't just about tomorrow, but about today. It's important to realize that our present is just as heavily impacted by the future we can imagine as it by the past we try to understand. The future we're able to imagine is an active element of the present, sometimes even more than the past. Unless we can imagine a future, we become hostages of those who falsify the past and who also falsify the possibility of a return to what never existed. It seems to me that our most, most urgent task is to be capable of imagining a future based on ma manifold realities, that is based on scientific, anthropological, social and psychoanalytic evidence, but a future that can likewise transcend all of these realities. This is why art has managed to produce the best responses to this radical moment we're currently living through. Our challenge right now is to discover how we can create an utopia grounded in too much clarity. I would like to close by listing, listing the precepts I consider vital to our debate about creating the future. One, at a time of human-made climate crisis, we must reverse political age hegemon age hegemonies and shift center and periphery. At a time of human-made climate crisis, the Amazon is the center of the world, or one of the centers of the world, and that's how it should be treated, not rhetorically, rhetorically, but with a real shift the Amazon is as central today as Washington, and much more central than Brasilia. Those who, who would like to transform the forest into a commodity realize this, and they are there. From Brazilian land grab grabbers to transnational mining companies to huge Chinese, in, Chinese energy concerns. This war is being fought in the Amazon, 
and it doesn't hurt to repeat the obvious. We are losing. Two, we need to reinvent our relation to space and time. When figures like Sweden's Greta Thunberg say we have to quit flying, they are not only call, calling, calling on everyone to be coherent in reducing their carbon footprint. They are proposing a new relationship with time. We cannot confront the climate crisis. We cannot talk of adapting to the climate crisis without radically changing our species' relation to space and time. Three, we know it no longer makes any sense to see the Amazon as a forest untouched by human hand. The Amazon is a cultural forest, which means this forest, which saves the planet every day, was also created by the humans who have lived, lived in for thousands of years. It was also created through the human management of plant species by the indigenous peoples of the forest of yesterday and today. Fundamental to our survival, this biodiversity was also created by the humans who are the solution. And it was likewise created by other peoples who live there, like the animals and insects who interact with plant species. This means the forest biodiversity will only be preserved if humans and other animal species are preserved. There is no way to create the future without a global pact to halt the extinction of the Amazon forest and the extinction of the peoples of the Amazon forest. Biodiversity loss is directly tied to the ethnocide and genocide of humans and non-humans. Four, it also seems to me that the possibility of a future is tightly linked to the rise of peripheries that demand to be the center. From Rio de Janeiro's favelas to the various peoples of the forest. For example, in March 2018, the murder of Paulo Sergio Nascimento, a forest leader, came only two days before that of Marielle Franco, a black woman from the favela of Maré, yet their deaths were only weakly connected. While the geographies of the leaders who have been killed or had their lives threatened in Brazil may differ, these leaders have something in common. common. They question hegemonic interests, stand up to organized crime, institutional and non-institutional, and represent new emerging forces and exert mounting influence within the dispute over our present. Those who have been murdered, like Marielle Franco and Paulo Sergio Nascimento, are precisely those who represent new ideas about how to be Brazil. The best and most powerful parts of today's Brazil are the peripheries that demand their place in the center. But the leaders of these multiple, mov multiple movements are being shot and killed. What I want to make clear is that the peoples of the forest have deep understanding of the forest. They live in the forest without destroying it. We know that. But what we need to realize is that they signify even a bit more. They signify even a bit more. They challenge neoliberalism. Instead of property, belonging. Instead of individualism, collectivism. Instead of competition, collaboration. They care insurrection in their very bodies. They are the uprising incarnate. And that's why they are being crushed. It's fundamental that we understand this, because it's through these other ways of existing, these other forms of being on this planet, that we can create the future. Five, it's also impossible to create a future without abolishing the human species rule over other species. We have to understand other species as other peoples. We are exterminating the future of all these other peoples, not just of human peoples. As scientists tell us this week, one million species are at risk. We devour worlds, and now the world is devouring us. Creating the commons will also entail understanding that being is much more than being human. Six, 
We need to learn to do without hope. This is what the climate youth are telling us childish grown-ups at this historical moment. Some adults say these wonderful boys and girls gives, give us hope. And more than one has answered back. I'm not here to give you hope. I don't have any hope. We need to act. In 2015, when I began writing that hope is overrated, I was lambasted by people who didn't understand how to act without hope. Since hope is something touted by various ide ideologies and faith. The very new generation that has taken to the streets today, especially in Europe and Australia, at the students' climate strike or in movements like Extinction Rebellion, shows it has understood that is possible. This generation, which is growing up without prospects for the future, a generation unlike any other in human history from all angles, this generation understands life and activism differently because it, its members are living on a corroded planet. Hope, like despair, is a luxury we can no longer afford. There is no time for it. And there is no time for lamentations or melancholy. We must act. Act out of an ethical imperative. Thank you very much. There are some aspects of this. You know, in, in my 30th year writing about climate change, 2016, I wrote a piece, long essay, reflecting on learning. And um, I came to a similar conclusion, although I don't, I would dispute the word hoping at the centerpiece. It's, I came up, kind of came up with an agnostic serenity prayer, meaning God or whoever grant me the wisdom to know the things, the part of this thing I can't change, the part I can change. And science is like this interface that can tell you a little bit more about which things are changeable or not. Uh, but that doesn't, to me personally, doesn't come with an end to hope. It just means that there's an emergent, as you said, the dimensions of what's happening are beyond understanding. Uh, it's kind of like mortality, you know, I had a stroke in 2011, and I wrote about that too. That was my first experience with mortality, like, you know, in your face. And I was lucky, but it got me thinking about, you know, the nature of life. You know, do you give up hope about living a good life, even though you know you're going to die? So, I mean, that's just a question to pose going forward. I think it's mostly about interpretations of the same amazing phenomenon we're in the middle of. That's separate from the social, political questions. It's the, the emergent reality of... Uh, of what we've been doing to this planet the last 200 years and where we go from here. And, uh, and now a really interesting voice to go to from here would be the Vatican and what it's hoping to do, hoping <laughs> or planning <laughs> to do at the interface between all of these arenas. So Augusto, can you take the podium? So thank you, thank you very much, uh, and thank you for staying also after a long day and wonderful presentations. I, I've seen a lot of people going away, so thank you for staying. Um, and um, and I, I would like to say just to to show you my the spirit of my spirit of hope and ecumenism that I'm an Argentinian in the middle of many Brazilians. You see. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but um, I would like to thank uh, the Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies and, uh, and all the organizers for the generous invitation uh, to this conference. The fact that Harvard University uh, is hosting a conference on, on the Amazon, uh, even when I told people I'm going to a conference while I'm on the Amazon, to Harvard, to Harvard, they say. So, so the fact that you are hosting this in order to discuss the future of the planet is encouraging, is really encouraging for many of us. In the case of the Catholic Church, it's a boost for the preparation of the upcoming Synod of the Amazon in October 2019. This is a one-month gathering of the Pope with all the bishops of the Amazonian region and some scientists, experts, and consultants. And it's the process, it's the outcome of a four-year process of consultation and generating a network, a massive, massive network in the, all the region of the Amazon, led by a Catholic organization called REPAN, Red Panamazonica. 
and um, and and also I have to say that more than 80,000 people have been consulted and participated in local assemblies, uh, and all all that process will uh, well will end up and we start a new uh, stage of the process in October. So this is a boost for us uh, for for this uh, important gathering. The Pope and the bishops will discuss how can the church respond to the unique, I don't know if the gentleman is here yet, to the need crisis, not just about climate change, to the need crisis that the Amazon and its population are facing, but also the world. So my presentation, hence my contribution to imagining a good future for the Amazon will be threefold. First, I will introduce the importance of the Amazon region as a source of abundant life. Now, that will match a little bit with the, fir uh, the first session of, of scientists. Um, but I will emphasize a little bit more the importance of that to our own life. Second, I will address the importance of fostering intercultural dialogue with indigenous people uh, of the Amazon in order to care for the region and for the planet uh, in the line of what uh, Hélène was, was telling at the end. In, he, in her fifth point, I think. And finally, we'll introduce the importance of time. Amazingly, I didn't know that she was going to talk about the re, um, or redefining our relation with space and time. And the importance of time, time as history of struggles uh, and destruction, especially in the Amazon, but also time as a present moment full of opportunities. In the, in, in the Asian Greeks, they have different words to, to name time. No? So the chronos would be the historic time, but I will also want to emphasize the kairos, that is the time to the full, this important time that opens new paths for living differently and better. The Amazon is a region with abundance richness. Uh, and I think in the morning we heard a lot about the natural uh, richness. The, the Amazon basin encompasses one of our planet's largest reserves of biodiversity and fresh water. It also constitutes more than a third of the planet's primary forest. And although the oceans are the largest carbon sinks, as it was very, very well explained this morning, still the Amazon carbon sequestration is quite significant. And at the moment is uh, more than the carbon, car uh, carbon emissions per year uh, due to the burn of fossil fuels. So can you imagine, if we don't have the Amazon, we can, there's no way that we can continue living. The Amazon also contributes to abundant water fluxes uh, to the Amazon for us, uh, Paolo was telling us this morning, which makes the Amazon, I'm going to say it in a non-scientific way so that everybody can understand, I'm not a scientist. So this makes the Amazon one of the largest multipliers of humidity of the planet. Uh, just to think about, in, in Argentina, we have a, a very large region called the Pampa Humeda, where we produce food and we export food for half of the population of the world. Well, without the Amazon, there won't be any humidity, there won't be Pampa Humeda, there won't be food production or exportation, there will be a massive food security issue, just, just to start with. Uh, the Amazon forests are regulators of the water cycle of South America, but also of the world, one can argue. So this is incredible and needs, needs to be looked after. But the Amazon is also rich from a geopolitical perspective. The region covers more than seven and a half million square kilometers of forests, hills, courts, rivers, falls, uh, all interconnected by the river Amazon. And this territory is shared this is geopolitically really important. It's shared by nine countries. So you have, of course, and, and apologies for the Brazilians. I promise I'm a friend of yours. Eh? And I know that you are the, the, the país más grande del mundo. Eh? And, and the Amazon, they are very important. But it's not just about Brazil. Uh, it has Brazil, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, Guyana, Suriname, and, and French Guyana as well. Uh, and why I'm saying this, because uh, these, all these uh, countries, uh, they, they have different political trends. And some of the problems that, or it are, uh, that people from one country suffered, actually it's the same region. I was uh, 
last week with a chief of another tribe, not a Yanomami, that they live in the border with, in the, they are Brazilians, they live in the border with Peru. The river is contaminated. This is a chief of a very important tribe. His wife has cancer and is about to die if, if it's not receive a new treatment. Has cancer and they are very young. Why? Because the river is contaminated with mercury. Now the mercury is not produced in Brazil. It's produced in Peru. So you see, this is not just a, a matter of one country. It's a matter of a region that en encompasses all these countries, uh, which makes it more interesting to, to study and to address. Um, and there are many indigenous communities also in all this region, um, and, and, lo and other local populations offer also a unique cultural richness. This, is, this was not that, that uh, emphasized this morning. And I would like to emphasize because as, as in the line of what Elo Eloise was saying, there's no way to protect the natural richness without the cultural richness of the Amazon. They are interconnected. Uh, and this source of factual wealth, this, so the, the, the Amazon is like a microorganism of, of the world. And this source of factual wealth is vital for the health of the planet. And of course, the Pope has said that the Amazon is like a lung, but well, as you know, in a university, any analogy has more dissimilarities than similarities. Yeah, actually, it's not that good analogy because, well, maybe one can live with one lung, but we are talking about, it's like the heart. We cannot live without a heart. <laughs> it's that vital organ. Everything, so this source of actual wealth is vital for the health of all. So everything that happens in the Amazon has an effect in the rest of the world. And that's really important to say it and to repeat it and every now and again, <laughs> or more than every time we can. So we can push the analogy even more and say that what is happening in the Amazon mirrors what is happening in the world. Why I'm saying that? Because uh, there is what, happen what is happening in the Amazon in a nutshell. There is an unbridled, an unbridled exploitation of nature and a disregard to the human rights of indigenous people. Oh, what a coincidence. <laughs> there is forced migration of people to cities, which rapidly grow without any planning, any planning whatsoever, with all the problems that this comprises in any big city without planning. There is illegal and legal corruption, I would like to emphasize, illegal and legal corruption based on an extractive and destructive mentality which does not recognize any limit to human activities fomenting a culture of dominion, pollution, and waste. This is all in the Amazon, but maybe it's also a mirror of what's happening elsewhere. In the Amazon and in the world, I would say, we face a situation of neo-colonialism, meaning the colonization of minds, bodies, communities, and territories by a particular model of development, a model which, promise, which promises of well-being for all are rarely fulfilled, a model with imp implementation is destroying the earth, our common home, which, as the Pope says, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth and not as the beauty that was described before me. If the Amazon and its multiple richness, geopolitical, cultural, you name it, is key for the life and the future of the entire planet, I would say it is suicidal to continue destroying it, isn't it? Inter international experts agree that the Amazon rainforest is the second most vulnerable area of the planet after the Arctic. Uh, and by the way, I was with uh, some indigenous people uh, from the Arctic the week before, and what's happening in the Arctic is, is as terrible as what's, what's happening in the Amazon, but we'll come later on about it. <laughs> so, uh, and this is because it's related to a climate crisis of anthropocenic origin. Deforestation and extractive industries merged with the global temperature rise are leading the Amazon towards a tipping point, as we heard this morning. Soon the Amazon, and the noble, noble brothers can correct me if I'm wrong, but soon the Amazon will not be able to provide the life that has provided for ages. It will be a different thing. So how do we change the way we treat the Amazon if this is so important for everybody? 
how do we care for this vital organism of the planet? There's no unique solution. Of, I'm, I'm afraid to disappoint you. But I, I, will, I, will, I have some ideas, or we have some ideas that we, have, we are developing with others from the church. First, we need to address the main cause of the problem, not to, not to address the, only the, the externalities, as some people would say, eh, or, or the symptoms, but the causes of the problem. Now, one of the main causes of the problem is this model of international development that I mentioned before. So we can claim for rights, we can do all the technical research that we want, but let's be honest, at the heart of this problem is this model of international development based on the myth of unlimited material growth, as, as if we could grow materially without any limit. Uh, that is forging companies and countries to extract whatever they can from regions like the Amazon. And they do so in order to feed a culture of consumerism and waste that is turning the planet into a giant landfill. According to Pope Francis, this model of development is suffocating, fa faceless, and motherless. It's interesting because the people in the Amazon, they call the mother nature or mother earth. No? And this model is, is faithless, is motherless. We need to replace it, therefore, for a model of development that enhances concrete human beings and communities, and that recognizes our special relationship and dependence with nature, as previous speaker was saying, or as many religious and spiritual traditions like to call it with Mother Earth. In the Pope's word, the defense of the Earth, actually the defense of the Amazon, has no other purpose than the defense of life, of our, of, of our family, of human beings that we live in a common home. But the shift of the current extractive and destructive development model is not easy. It's very easy to blame companies, but actually companies, they produce and to make money. It's very easy to blame the governments, but actually the governments, they need revenues to sustain their own policies. Um, as um, if they, they, they were, it was very well explained, how can governments try to practically practically tackle this, this issue. But actually, the, if we want to really shift the model, we cannot blame each other. We need everybody has to change. Some more than others, but everybody has to change. It requires a profound global dialogue in search of certain consensus for processes of change. And process, I mean in process because we, we have to be in a process of change. It's not to say, now I'm changing. Now I have changed. This is something that we know in religion is called conversion. We cannot say, I cannot say, I'm a converted priest. I'm a, I'm a holy now. No, that's, don't believe to anybody if, if who says that. Eh? I, need to, I, I need to run a process of conversion every day. The same with us in this model of development, because it requires a change in economics and politics, in education, in our own lifestyles. And such a, such a radical transformation needs a strong motivation. Now, I like Marina mentioned uh, motivation uh, this morning because, and I want to emphasize that, if I have to change my computer, well, uh, I don't need that strong motivation. You just give me uh, some data, this is better, and I will change it. But if you ask me, well, you stop being a priest or move from Rome to Zimbabwe or to Sri Lanka or stop being a Christian and become, become a Buddhist. Well, if I have to do that, I, that will require a strong motivation, don't you think? Well, we are talking about even a more radical transformation in economics and politics. And therefore, that's really important to talk about the motivations for change. Scientists have been the prophets of this process. They have, you have been talking since, since the 70s, really, I mean, crystal, crystal clear. We, and we are still having politicians, presidents of big countries, even bigger than Brazil, <laughs> that's, that are saying, I don't believe in climate change, as if it was something to believe. Uh, we, we are still having companies that are exploiting without taking care of the damage that they're causing. So what happens that scientists can, could not cap, capture the imagination of people to change? Well, we need scientists as the prophets just to keep on with a good prophecy. But we need further motivations. Now, people won't change also because academics 
say it, I don't know, social, sci social scientists, I would say. Oh, well, how interesting, but we will debate, but not necessarily we will change that dramatically. 80% of the population in the world they claim to be religious or to believe in something. And psychological studies are very clear that the source of deep transformation and motivation uh, comes from what people believe and what their values. So this is something that f indigenous communities and their values, religions and their values can contribute to this motivation for change. Uh, I know that religions too often are the source of conflict, but they could also be the source of this motivation for a better world. Most religious religions advocate for the caring of people and all what God has created. Recovering or emphasizing that spiritual source of change can contribute substantially to commonly designed models that can actually promote integral human development, means development for all the person and for all, and integral ecology for all the earth, for all the ecosystems. And given that the Amazon is a vital region of the life of the world, and considering that indigenous people who have been inhabiting that land for centuries know how to live in harmony with it, as Elaine talked us also about, their wisdom cannot be left out. I am so, so honored to share this conference with uh, Davi. I am, their wisdom cannot be left out. On the contrary, as the Pope, as Pope Francis emphasizes, they need to be privileged interlocutors of this dialogue of redesigning development. Privileged interlocutors. We are not talking about, uh, let's talk about with Davi how to care for, for, for this little land uh, this little region of the Amazon. No, no, no. In privileged interlocutors, how could we resign the whole model of development? Because they have a circular mentality of development that, they, that we need. We need to learn from them. Indigenous people also remind us about the sacredness of the land, which is not, near, not merely a natural resource. I have to say I hate the word natural resource or human resource. We're not just resources. The land is not our resource. Uh, we, we cannot live with that land, so it's not just a resource uh, or a commodity, but rather a source of life and a gift of God uh, for those who are believers. But even if you don't believe on, in God, we, we belong to the land. Uh, we are part of the land of the earth, and our own human identity is linked to it. Our identity is linked to the land. A serious interaction with indigenous cultures from the Amazon, therefore, it's necessary to help us to recover that sense of earthliness. We are people from the earth, and we are going back to the earth when we will die, and to find new ways of caring for the territory, thus for all the planet. And, uh, and I will go very, very quickly to this, about the sense of history. The occupation, I have to say something about the history of the Amazon. The occupation and colonization of indigenous lands in Latin America was an extensive process of domination conducted by Spanish and Portuguese colonizers, which was full of contradictions. Uh, they were accompanied by church ministers, for example, and created deep wounds. Deep wounds. St. John Paul II begged forgiveness for the church's silence or even complicit attitudes at the beginning of this century. But hold on a minute, before you say, yes, the church has the, is guilty, Today, unfortunately, 50, 100, 500 years after the conquest and 200 years after the independence of the Amazonian countries, analogous colonizing attitudes still exist. These new forms of colonialism conceive Amazonian territories as free lands to be exploited, regardless of the population, regardless of the harm inflicted to the ecosystem. For Pope Francis, indigenous population in the Amazon basin have never been as threatened as they, as, 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 this, as they are today. And that's why I haven't heard any ap apology, for example, from the rubber company, from the atrocities that they did in the, the, in the early 20th centuries. That had nothing to do with the church and with Spanish colonizer. It was about the rubber industry to feed basically, not the Europe and North America's uh, lifestyles. But why is this historical time important? Not just because of the negative side of the crisis, but also because the crisis is as a, a unique opportunity to change the way we treat the Amazon, 
hence the way we shape the future of our planet. What the world can do is not just to claim for the respect of the rights, of the rights of indigenous people that they have, but to listen to them. We, can, we have to listen to them, particularly in order to change the extractive development model and to ideate a caring model which can promote good life for them and for the rest of the world too, in solidarity with one another, overcoming individualism, the personal individualism and collective individualism. Yet this change, as I said before, uh, requires personal conversion from the way we live in countries that are benefited from the exploitation of the Amazon. I have to say that. I know that is uncomfortable. But we cannot have a conference of the Amazon without identifying that we are bene beneficiaries from the exploitation of that territory. So we have to change something as well. The change needed is a change of heart, mentality, and of structures. Of heart, because it's about the way we relate to the ecosystem that sustain life on Earth and to our brothers and sisters who protect it. Of mentality, because we need to change the way we conceive production, trade, consumption, and waste. We should produce in an unharmful way, trading fairly and consuming responsibly. Yet we also need to change the structures that prevent us from doing so. That means the current development status quo that is leading us to destruction. And I'm my last, last words is learning from indigenous people from the Amazon will help us to walk through these changes that we need. We will re rediscover our bond with the earth, with the land, and, with, and how our model of human development cannot be detached from it. It's, it's just insane to conceive a human model of development detached with the land. It will help us also to listen to them. It will help us to promote actually circular economy an economy with no waste, where life is boosted rather than trashed. It will help us to raise our voices alongside them in a prophetic call for change, a change that is urgently needed if we want to defend life on Earth. We are facing a serious crisis, but it is also an opportunity, a kairos, a time to change and embrace life to the full. We as human beings are capable of the worst, at least I am, I know you, but we are capable of the worst. Look at what we are doing in the Amazon. Uh, look at what's happening in this spacing. But we are also capable of rising above ourselves, choosing again what is good. We are capable of making a new start. This is what the Amazon and their population are offering to us. It's an offer. It's a unique offer. So let us start again, and with the Amazonian people, like... Davi and, and, and his community. Let us create a new and different world. Thank you. So uh, we have about 35, maybe 40 minutes. Maybe, they, he's, they said like till maybe 4.30 even. So if we, depending on you, it all depends on you, your energy level and your solution, your solution passion. I, want, I just want to start by, Eliani said let's act and not hope. And I think that's a really important point. Setting aside the debate about hope, I think is important because we can call it anything. But acting, and you mentioned um, one of your points was uh, moving from the, having the periphery become the center again. Meaning, if you're in a favela or in, a, in, in the Amazon, how do you become empowered again? And I, this still leads me back, I'm a communicator, it leads me back to the tools we have around us right now, the social media. There are ways for the uh, underprivileged, the invisible among us to actually implement change. This happened in Flint, Michigan. A very poor community, lead in the water. The press ignored them, local officials ignored them, the EPA ignored them, and they found a solution. So maybe start with Eliani. What would, what's, the, what's the action? What are some of the actions you might want to have people jump to right now? I'm not, uh, I don't feel safe about my English to, to tell oh. the, uh, no, about okay. delicate things then. So or maybe you could translate. I, know, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> no, no. Uh. So let, let me sit uh, between them two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So It seems that, uh, just to reiterate, it seems that one of the key opportunities is to 
make the peripheral more central. Whether the goal is political change or just getting a solution on, you know, to an environmental problem or, yeah. So with that in mind, you, you know, what comes to mind is an action that can be taken now. Um, Eu, eu começo a pensar nisso porque uh, no Brasil, claramente, a gente tem uma barreira entre o que são periferias, mas que, na verdade, são centros, que é como eu mencionava, né? a questão da... Tem coisas uh, importantíssimas acontecendo nas favelas urbanas das cidades e tem coisas importantíssimas uh, acontecendo na nas florestas, na floresta, em outros biomas, como Cerrado, etc. Só que a gente não consegue fazer a ponte entre essas periferias. Uh, e por isso que eu dou o exemplo entre a, os, a, o Paulo Sérgio, que morreu dois, dois dias antes, e quem sabe, quem lembra do Paulo Sérgio? Né, a gente tá, eu, eu mesma estou lembrando todos os dias da Marielle, mas, quer dizer, são, são, são essas mortes elas estão conectadas. Tem, uma mulher como a Marielle tem muito mais em comum com alguém como o Paulo Sérgio do que qualquer pessoa, uh, do que uma, alguém de classe média, de classe alta, que mora no Leblon, Ipanema, Vila Madalena, no Rio ou Vila Madalena, em São Paulo. Então, eu acho que é urgente fazer com que... Inverter. Eu, 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 não, eu não acho que a gente cria um futuro sem fazer o deslocamento do que é periferia e do que é centro. E aí a gente chega na questão da Amazônia. Não se pode tratar a Amazônia como algo que está longe. A Amazônia é central, porque sem, sem, sem a floresta, como todo mundo já disse aqui hoje, não há futuro possível. Isso é um fato. E eu acho que essas coisas acontecem também, não acontecem só por redes sociais, ou não acontecem pela internet. Elas acontecem, elas têm que acontecer com o corpo, com o corpo encarnado, com a presença. Então, por exemplo, encontros como esses também têm que acontecer lá na Amazônia. Não em Manaus, não em Belém, mas na floresta. Os intelectuais, a gente tem que não tem que ter só o Davi Copanawa aqui, mas outros intelectuais da floresta. Porque há outro tipo de intelectuais e a gente cada vez mais precisa ouvir esses intelectuais da floresta que vêm de outras, de outras tradições. Uhum. Né? Então a gente precisa fazer uma inversão, um deslocamento disso. Uhum. Uh, this is a funny talk. I'll do my best. Um, so, oh, you guys got that. Yeah. Uh, I was writing that seriously. Um, <laughs> just uh, along those lines, um, you might have to interpret. The, uh, two things. It, it seems to come down to motivation, having a widespread motivation to um, act. Uh, and. The church, in, in 1989, when I was reporting the burning season, I learned how Moacir Greci, who was this, um, he was the local church leader in the western part of Acre, the, the radio station that the church ran was a critical part of the communication network of the uh, rubber tappers, the Serengueros. Then they had Radio Sipa, what they called, which was their own, hey, there's ranchers cutting illegally, we need to go down the road. But the church didn't have to do that, and most didn't have to do that. I mean, and, and you see this today. It's, and this, I think the media have new um, modes of operating. In Ohio, where there's, you know, America has 40 or 50,000 people dying from opioid addiction every year because of these drug companies. And a newspaper in Ohio reinvented itself. It was an old-fashioned newspaper printing, you know, today's news. And now it's called... Um, Uh, Your Voice Ohio, and the newspaper is listening to people and helping people communicate with each other and come up with solutions. And that's a motivation thing. I, so is that, I think a big chunk of what's missing is motivation. Now, Luis, you talked about a lot of work 
that went into those decisions you were t describing. Many different uh, factions and... That's right. That, that's... But it's, it's the practicality of... It's like you, you have to... Uh, um, you can resist many times, but you have to really connect and create a vision that you can motivate people to act and to mobilize and to really, to really have the possibility to change the power relations. And, and I make emphasis on this because uh, we are seeing this happening now uh, in terms of global leaders that are not committed to a uh, global vision that is, is more towards the common. But also you see that in Latin America, uh, in Brazil or in other countries, um, Colombia is a case, when you are like moving backwards and those who have been resisting for a long time have not the, uh, the practicality of the vision to implement what they want. And, and, and that's, 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 that's very important. The, the Pope Francis was in Colombia and the main message was protect the Amazon, mm -hmm. but not much happened. <laughs> but, but I want to be very sincere about that. It's like, how really you think about implementing those vision that is not more business as usual, but only rhetoric. So this is why with, with Santo we said, let's do something to, be, to see what happened. It's not in a vacuum. Yeah, uh, thank you for that reminder. Yeah, what the church can, can do is to say, to, to to, strength, to, yeah, to emphasize the moral um, mandate, uh, but we are not the experts of how to do it politically. So I think that's why we, something that nature is, uh, is, is teaching us, or is almost shouting at us, is the interconnected thing. Everything is interconnected. So what can we do in the Amazon? You, you say, well, practical things. Well, but practical things, can, comes from a vision and comes from a thinking. We need sciences as well. We, we, because if you act without thinking, well, then probably you would act wrongly. It's a good discussion because it's part of how you bring different people to here. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you the example of Colombia, where you have Afro-Colombian, 20% of the population, uh, a lot of priests. It have been very difficult to move to, to the bishops. I don't know how it works, the church. But it's like you see that. And you want to have diverse voices in those spaces of power that comes from ethical questions that the church does, but also from political questions, more from the pragmatism. But they are not taking those decisions. They, I'm sure, and I, I based on experience on the political side, the discussion when I was in those meetings was very different from discussion that usually you have in those levels in Colombia that changed the dynamic. It's like how you permit the system power <coughs> to move toward a different vision, and also how you create new ones that come from the favelas, from the forest, from people that are resisting but don't, don't find the way to get there because you ask them, but they are not on the table participating. So that's what I'm thinking about. And it's, I don't have any answer to that. It's, it's just experiential what I have learned, I have seen. And it's also part of my own frustration. Yeah. And, uh, Davi, I would love to know if um, you can, if you had a call to action, specific need that someone like National Geographic Society or this university can help you with, not because you have priceless knowledge, mm. but because you have a right to be where you are in the world? Mm. What would that be? You can think about it. Doesn't, we can talk about it tomorrow. No, I, I just told him not to speak in Yanomami. I learned a couple of things, but not, not enough. Not yet. 
Tem que estudar para aprender. Peraí. É... Nós, povo Yanomami, de Kuana, é, povo indígena do Brasil, nós necessita de garantir, garantir a grande alma da floresta. Não é só a floresta, a terra também. A terra é fundamental. Sem a terra, sem a floresta, sem o água limpo, não tem vida. Eu acho que é importante vocês, nós, homens, as mulheres, Pensar, pensar e respirar e como os, é, a sociedade não indígena discutindo sobre a defesa da planeta Terra, que quer realmente decidir e é, colocar a reunião, grande reunião, e juntar a autoridade. Corrida a autoridade da, destru, da destruindo. Nós, pessoal aqui, ninguém está destruindo, não. Quem está destruindo? É, tem um poder de dinheiro. O poder de dinheiro está no. A, de, a, está com um mal cheio de dinheiro, então é que ele é culpado. Eu acho que quer colocar a reunião e a consultar as lideranças não indígenas, que está sempre, sempre fica pensando, olhando, querendo mais tirar, querendo mais destruir, E não pensa de nós. Ele só pensa para eles. Pensa a sua família, para os filhos. Então, aqui ele não está... Essa é, é, autoridade que é destruidor, ele não está tá preocupado com nós. Ele não está preocupado de nós, povo indígena. Eu acho que é melhor é vocês pensar, é colocar uma reunião para chamar a atenção do destruidor, para ele parar de, de fazer desmatamento, destruir a terra e rascando a terra deixando ficar fraco, deixando morrendo muita gente, deixando esse problema. Dois mundos inteiros. Então, esse aí é o meu pensamento. Esse aí é o meu pensamento. Eu, Davi, aprendi a é, olhar nessa caminho. Então, o que é construir nosso caminho para é, resolver, eu acho que é, é muito difícil para resolver. A gente fala, vamos resolver, não resolve nada. Por quê? Cresceu muita gente. Crescendo muita gente da Europa, do Brasil, Venezuela, Colômbia, e criando muita gente, criando muita criança, filhos. Então, é, mercadoria, o mercadoria da capital, Estado, 
criar, criar muito problema. A raiz está fundo. O raiz já cresceu há fácil tempo. Só fica olhando para cima, ninguém, ninguém resolve o que, que nós, o que, que mergulhar para ver aonde está um, precisando nós salvar a nossa coração da terra, mãe. Nós, Yanomami, nós, Yanomami e Equana, indígenas, chama a terra mãe nossa, aonde nós nascemos aonde nos criamos, aonde nos é, aprendemos, a terra, ele ensina para a gente conversar, ensina para dançar, ensina para comer, ensina tudo. Então, ali tem que é, começar a olhar, no, no fundo, no fundo, aonde que a, a mãe terra está precisando, nós, é, ajudar ele para tentar salvar a planeta Terra, o pomal da Terra. Sem a pomão, não tem vida. Todos nós estamos mortos. Eu sou também formado, formado como Xabiri espiritualmente que eu aprendi com meus, a sua liderança ensinou nosso caminho para defender a nossa mãe terra a nossa irmão a nossa irmã a floresta para a gente viver bem viver bem com saúde viver bem tranquilo como estava antigamente agora está Está muito grande para resolver. Oi? Obrigado. Okay. Um, there, is, there, there are organizations that work really hard with indigenous peoples in Brazil. Um, the Instituto Socioambiental, I was at the offices in December, and they're kind of like a nervous system for the Amazon. They're helping to connect tribes with each other and with the outside world, so you can also think about donating to these organizations that help people be people. That's an important part of the journey forward. Some questions on the audience. Um, try to keep them brief and we'll keep this going. Uh, right here. Um, mm -hmm. here, I'm trying to remember your first name. Marina. Marina, Marina Hiroto. Okay. Thank you. Um, shall I speak in English or in Portuguese? <laughs> Portuguese. Portuguese, Portuguese yeah. A minha pergunta é mais uma curiosidade, na verdade, porque a gente estava falando de manhã sobre, e, e a gente está falando ainda, né, sobre a possibilidade de encontrar uma forma de uma nova visão para o futuro. E eu acredito que isso está muito nas crianças e nas lideranças é, adolescentes, enfim, nas, nas pessoas mais novas e nas mais velhas. Enfim, mas com relação às mais novas, eu queria saber, talvez, de todos vocês, dentro daquilo que vocês fazem, é, qual é a experiência que vocês têm com crianças? Então, eu já ouvi muitas coisas sobre os indígenas, mas eu gostaria de saber um pouco mais em como as crianças são criadas e qual é a motivação que é dada, é dada para elas, por exemplo, para elas ficarem na floresta, para elas cuidarem da floresta, porque isso pode ser um exemplo do que a gente pode fazer com as nossas crianças, né? que talvez a gente ensine de uma forma muito diferente. A gente ensine que outras coisas são têm valor é, e não essas, de da natureza e etc. Então, talvez na Colômbia e nas expedições que a Elaine participou. E com relação à Igreja Católica, como vocês veem essas jovens lideranças e como isso é tratado? Porque eu acho que podem ser lições para nós, né? de uma forma geral. Um, uh, thank you, thank you for your question. We'll answer in English. Um, this is a, a, a very a super important thing. The, um, what we are addressing is the education, but broadly speaking, not just the formal education. What we discovered. Um, worldwide, I would say, because the 
whole church is that there's a um, a good reception of um, of the young generation, particularly the very young. I mean, even um, between five and and eleven, because what the ones who are campaigning are already adolescents. But but even the the next generation, they're they're even better. But is that is not just uh, thanks to our own education from a Catholic perspective. It also matches what they are learning at school um, and from well from science, etc. However, we have a we I can say that there are different uh, problems. One is we are trying to develop uh, deeper our the teaching of basic catechesis worldwide, where the children go and for first communion when they're young and um, we have the, the story of creation, the, the story of the Genesis and it's told, but somehow we need to, f to train the catechist so that they can teach this in the, in the proper way and connect it with what's happening now. For example, in the Amazon or in the Arctic. And not, it's not easy. Uh, in some places, it's in, in, in India, for example, there's some, some schools and, and, and big parishes are, are doing a wonderful job. Uh, in Latin America, it's not that easy. Uh, it's not that easy, but uh, it is in the Amazonian. Yes, in the, in the Amazonian, uh, in, in the foresta, not in the big cities. Sadly, the majority of the population of the Amazon lives in the big cities. So the, the problem that we're facing now is how to uh, change all the the way we're teaching catechesis so that they, that's, this can be completely aligned with with the action and care for the for the um, for the region because what we I, what, what I would like to what uh, Elian said is that uh, hope if it's ideological is is hopeless <laughs> but while you act there is hope when you see Greta Thunberg and all that you have hope when you see the Yanomami or the indigenous people claiming for the, for the rights, you have hope. When they see scientists putting these papers like they, they were putting in the morning, you have hope. So what we are trying to do is that they, they, the religious beliefs move alongside the care for the environment. That's easier in a rural environment. We are in an urban environment, it's, it's, ver, it's a bit more difficult for, for other regions that are not religions, it's for a cultural perspective. But I, maybe, maybe other people have something more to say. Just, just saying, in terms of what motiv motivate, um, I see a lot of seeds for uh, different futures, uh, and uh, two of them I, uh, is is something that um, impressed me in Colombia regarding the new development of uh, young people, teenagers, children that sue the government. Uh, because of the destruction of the Amazon, and and they are, <laughs> that's very interesting, and they um, and the um, um, justice court, the National Justice Court, uh, Court the Suprema, Supreme Court, ruled that the Amazon have its rights in itself. That's very that's fascinating. With the influence of the Pope. Mm -hmm. And uh, the trip to Colombia, and um, also, but but surely because we have very good reflection on peace and environment uh, in that trip, and also another court, the Constitutional Court, ruled before that the Atrato River in Chocó also have its own rights, and the third is. One of the paramos, the paramo de Pisba, that also one court ruled that. But was a civil society movement from very young people. That's one thing. And the other is, is how do you relate to the to the forest, particularly in Afro-Colombian communities. The relation is is very different. It's more you respect the nature uh, because you depend on it. And most of the model that they have been proposing to Colombia long before the vision is very different. Is you co you protect the environment, you protect biodiversity, but you can use it in a sustainable way. They have been doing that for a long time. 
But now only they are, in, they are founding some possibilities to make that happen. So still this is a conflict of, of vision, but I see more openness to that with those seeds of change in the, in the, in the right direction. There's a question in the back. I'm not sure. Oh, you have the... no, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah, OK. Elani. <laughs> Eliane. Uh, Eu não quero romantizar né, essa a educação. É, eu acho que assim tem. Eu vejo nas comunidades que eu que eu com as quais eu trabalho, que é especialmente comunidades ribeirinhas, não são comunidades indígenas, são comunidades ribeirinhas. É esse grande esforço é, da, da, do, do pertencimento né, à floresta que a floresta não é uma propriedade, é um pertencimento que se faz pelo exemplo e pela transmissão oral. Uh, e acompanho né, alguns trabalhos, como o trabalho excelente que o Isa faz uh, junto às reservas extrativistas, né, que é viver daquilo que a floresta uh, produz né, e fazer, quando comercializa, comercializa a castanha, comercializa os produtos da floresta. Mas eu acho que a gente não está uh, num momento em que a gente, a gente possa... A gente tem que falar claramente que a, hoje no Brasil, a maioria dessas comunidades que estão resistindo na floresta, que protegem efetivamente a floresta, porque os números mostram para a gente que as, a, a floresta resiste nas áreas protegidas, nas áreas indígenas, nas áreas que são unidades de conservação, estão extremamente pressionados pela grilagem e pela extração de madeira. Então, uh, não adianta muito a gente falar, como edu, uh, claro que como educa é importante, mas se não tiver o apoio uh, do planeta, se não tiver o apoio desses países, né? agora há pouco tempo, semana passada, mais de 600 cientistas assinaram um documento pedindo que a Europa pare de importar desmatamento. Quer dizer, não, não adianta uh, a gente... Se, nós, se a gente não apoiar essas comunidades e apoiar concretamente, é muito difícil. Os grileiros estão lá agora, nas unidades de conservação, nas terras indígenas, tirando madeira. Se esses ribeirinhos que tanto resistindo há, tan, há mais de um século em cima da floresta, eles são, às vezes, obrigados a colaborar, porque senão eles morrem. Porque, como a gente sabe, o sistema de proteção do Brasil foi todo desmantelado. Eles não têm proteção. Então, a gente está num ponto de emergência. Né? E, e é, eu gosto muito de acompanhar a estética que as coisas acontecem. Por exemplo, que hoje a, a maior parte das lideranças uh, na floresta, nas comunidades ribeirinhas e também nas periferias urbanas são mulheres. E quando as mulheres... Uh, uh, e eu tento me inspirar um pouco nelas quando eu falo. porque eu não, é, Quando as mulheres falam, é assim... É, Sabe, não é conversa de salão. Assim a gente vai, a gente está ferrado. Não dá para conversar como se o que estivesse acontecendo no Brasil fosse normal. Não é normal. Né? A gente não tá, a gente está vivendo um cotidiano de exceção. E lá na floresta agora está cheio de madeireiro tirando terra e às vezes tirando terra com a ajuda de famílias ribeirinhas, porque se elas não, não, não fizerem isso, elas são assassinadas. Né? Então, é, de, é com isso que a gente está lidando. E aí eu queria, já que a, a esperança ela tem sido tão citada, eu acho que uh, o que eu quero dizer uh, é que eu acho que a esperança está... Tra... A necessidade de esperança, que a gente pode fazer um simpósio inteiro sobre isso, sobre as motivações, as, o que, os conceitos filosóficos, religiosos de esperança... Uh, mas nem não tem, não, a gente não tem tempo para isso, mas quer dizer, a gente, nós ocidentais, uh, fomos criar com toda a nossa tradição, fomos educados, criados, formados para acreditar que não se pode viver sem esperança. Eu quero dizer que sim, se pode. O que, que acontece hoje no Brasil? A gente, quem é que tem esperança olhando para o que o bolsonarismo está fazendo rapidamente? O que a gente vê assim, ninguém solta a mão de ninguém, mas ninguém solta a mão de ninguém apavorado, porque as pessoas estão paralisadas, como se elas fossem reféns. Né? Porque elas acham que precisa ter esperança para agir. Não, não precisa. Não precisa. A gente vai ter que dar um jeito de fazer sem esperança. Fazer, tem que agir. 
E nisso eu acho que as, os adolescentes hoje da juventude pelo clima, que estão fazendo a greve climática das sextas-feiras, eles, se eles têm uma conexão uh, que eu acho muito interessante, que é uma conexão, sei lá, como ela acontece, com as lideranças da floresta. Porque eu, eu, eu adoro uma frase que o Viveiros de Castro diz, que assim, os índios entendem de fim de mundo porque o mundo deles já acabou. No Brasil, acabou em 1500. E talvez eles queiram nos dizer como é que dá para viver depois do fim do mundo. A minha experiência de viver em Altamira com as comunidades ribeirinhas me ensinou sobre isso. Porque essas pessoas, o mundo delas é destruído constantemente. Quando elas acham que elas têm um mundo, o mundo é afogado, o mundo é queimado. E elas vivem. E não é por esperança. É por, por, é por vida. Então, assim, eu acho que, que, que eu, eu vejo essa conexão, que nem quando eu falo, quando eu entrevisto as, as meninas, os meninos do clima, mas eu entrevistei meninas, é, eu não tenho esperança, mas elas estão ali, na rua, com alegria. E o que eu quero dizer é que no momento de uma crise em que a gente nunca viveu igual, que é quando a gente se, se transforma, se converte na própria ameaça, quando a gente chega nesse ponto, tem uma, um outro humano que está se formando. Tem um outro jeito de ser humano. A gente está num além, em algo que a gente nunca viveu. Então, aquelas coisas que, que sempre foram constitutivas da gente, elas estão em questionamento. E a esperança é uma delas. Não tenho nada contra a esperança. Mas, assim, não fica esperando esperança. A gente tem que agir. Um, I, th I think it's very wonderful to live without hope in the hope that something's going to happen. And I think your attitude is very nice. But, and you also have other options. You've talked about hope. You've also mentioned doing something at a university to raise attention, which is absolutely marvelous, as are non-governmental organizations. But I haven't heard any mention yet of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights or the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, which right now, even including the case of Altamira, they have actually taken cases re involving indigenous peoples, lands, environment. I've been involved in three of them myself. Uh, they don't, they are not the answer. They have to be combined with a lot of publicity and a lot of NGO help, but they can be very successful, and they've made a major change in indigenous territory. Um, I was thinking, I'm, which I'm sure that he knows, uh, redefined property. So the, uh, the efforts that the governments are making have some opposition, and I would strongly recommend approaching both the commission, and if the commission goes with you, they pass it on to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights which has made some major, major decisions. And I think it would be very, very productive. You don't have to be hopeful, you can be practical. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, law matters. What's yes. your name, by the way? I'm Ted McDonald, I'm an anthropologist. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for that. I, I just want to, um, I cannot agree more. I, I'm. I used to be a lawyer before becoming a priest, so... Um, <laughs> Repenting uh, or something? Yeah, of course, because I, I was a corporate lawyer. Uh, so I was the lawyer of all the banks and oil companies, you see? So now I'm paying my finance. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to say that um, you're right, uh, so much so that this Red Panamasonica of the Catholic Church that is promoting this mega gathering and consult, um, well, part of, we are working very closely with the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, and they were, uh, at least four members, four high members of the court uh, were present at Georgetown University. A month ago, we had a, a conference on, on, with indigenous people and nine cardinals, uh, and they were present, and they presented a, a whole paper about certain cases. So uh, that's another thing that we are looking, we are, we are trying to partner with that and link it, and, and to link also all the things where they are doing with other tribes that are not necessarily connected. Because um, uh, something that the government, <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong, are very scared that if we push the civil society, the church, uh, if we push, because there's already um, the right of indigenous people is already recognized. In the, in the convention 169 of the, of the ILO, 
and, and biodiversity and all that, but there's a lot of material there. So all what we're, what we're trying to do is to partner with the right people who can work, um, work alongside them um, because uh, to defend their rights. But a clarification also, this is good news. The not so good news is if you live in the middle of the Amazon, and some, some, it's very difficult because if something happens there, you cannot say, I will call the police or I will, I will go to court. I mean, you will be killed. And that's what's happening with the indigenous people who are, who are speaking out. So on the one hand, we want to, to, to encourage them, but on the other hand, we have to be careful because we're talking about their, their own lives. Uh, and if you live there inland, uh, well, it's not it's not the same. Just 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 a, a, a word of of, uh, of warning as well. There was a question here. I need to speak in Portuguese because I am passionate, and and when I am passionate, I need to. <laughs> use my only language and it's the discussion about hope i can't live without hope and this doesn't mean uh, in portuguese or english <laughs> não é que eu, é que eu acho o seguinte quer dizer para mim eu tenho eu ajudei a criar um programa uh, 25 anos atrás para melhorar a qualidade de educação pública no brasil o nome desse programa, eu só estou trazendo isso, não estou fazendo propaganda, só estou dizendo que o nome desse programa chama-se Crer para Ver. É a inversão do, né, do ver para crer. Quer dizer, se a gente não acredita, se a gente não, e acreditar e ter esperança é mais ou menos similar, que é possível mudar, a gente cruza os braços, vai olhar a folha de coqueiro balançar e esperar que as coisas aconteçam. Para mim, a esperança é fundamental. Eu sou, basicamente, a minha história de vida de um homem de ação. Eu não sou intelectual, eu não sou acadêmico, eu sou de fazer as coisas. E eu concordo absolutamente com tudo que você colocou sobre o momento dramático que a gente vive, o call to action e a, e a importância de todos nós dentro das suas áreas de atuação, seja como empresário, como jornalista, como liderança indígena. Eu tive o privilégio de visitar o Davi Copenau na, na aldeia dele, nós tivemos como empresários tentando fazer da Amazônia um centro de desenvolvimento de produtos e de, de uso sustentável. Eu não vou ficar aqui contando a história, mas é só para dizer que eu tenho um problema sério de dizer que a gente tem que acabar com a esperança. Porque eu acho que quando acabar com a esperança, acabou a vida. A vida é uma manifestação de esperança de desenvolvimento. É a evolução. A evolução do ser o, o nosso Ed poderia falar muito melhor, ou o nosso caro Brian, falar sobre a evolução da vida. E evolução e esperança é acreditar que a evolução é possível. E que está ligado à nossa capacidade de agir. Então, eu, eu acho que o problema do amazônico é de uma complexidade que nenhum de nós pode dar conta isoladamente. Tem vários cientistas aqui, muito respeitáveis, fazendo trabalhos fantásticos, e pouco conseguimos fazer. Temos uma democracia que elegeu um presidente que é uma frustração para todos nós. Eu assino embaixo com você. Aliás, já assinei publicamente alguns manifestos antes da eleição, dizendo que eu achava perigosa a sua eleição. Mas o povo brasileiro elegeu e votou. Votou e elegeu. É um momento de muito risco. Ontem, numa conversa, o, o, o Beto Veríssimo, que está por aqui, é, falava desse momento único que a gente passa de desafio. O, o risco de um retrocesso em todo o framework institucional que defende um desenvolvimento minimamente sustentável, qualificado, é, é óbvio que estamos vivendo uma ameaça fundamental nesse momento. Agora, não pode perder a esperança. O, o Bolsonaro vai passar. O Trump vai passar. Se a gente for capaz de agir, se a gente garantir democracia, se a gente garantir participação social, se a gente melhorar a qualidade dos nossos discursos, se a gente deixar de falar só acadêmico ou só business ou só e falar com a dona Maria que vota no Bolsonaro ou o seu José, é, 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 eu acho que depende de nós sim. E nesse ponto eu concordo um milhão por cento com você, Eliane, mas 
por favor, quer dizer, eu me, me reservo o direito de continuar tendo esperança de que as coisas vão eu... melhorar se a gente fizer o que tem que ser feito. Eu fico muito Desculpe feliz. Desculpe o desabafo. <risos> Eu fico muito feliz que tu tenha esperança. E eu não sou de forma nenhuma mais exterminadora da esperança. Eu sou contra a esperança. Eu só só estou dizendo que uh, a gente pode viver sem esperança. Tu tem uma experiência de vida e a tua experiência de vida dá conta de que tu tem esperança. Ótimo. Agora existem outros grupos de pessoas que não tem esse luxo de ter esperança que tu tem. Pessoas extremamente atingidas por políticas neoliberais, que cujas, cas cujas casas, cujas terras estão queimando. Pessoas que estão morrendo. Pessoas que conhecem uma vida de morte. E eu posso testemunhar que, mesmo assim, elas vivem e elas lutam. E essa também é uma experiência muito sofisticada de viver, que eu acho que a gente está... Uh, conhecendo com mais profundidade agora. Então, eu acho que que bom que nosso mundo tem uh, diferentes experiências de ver e de ser vivo. E eu espero... Uh, eu espero... Oh, agora eu tenho esperança. Mas isso é linguístico. Eu gostaria que tivesse... Uh, Pode ter um mundo em que todo mundo tem esse luxo, o luxo de ter esperança, mas tu pode ter certeza que muitos, muitos grupos de pessoas não têm o luxo de ter esperança, mas essas pessoas, elas não são uh, vítimas, elas, têm, elas encontram outras formas de viver, elas têm alegria, elas, elas resistem e elas lutam. But their world can change. <laughs> But their world can change, no? <laughs> their world can change. Their conditions can change. Eu não sei. É, é, a gente ouviu. É, o mundo pode mudar, mas assim, que mundo tu está falando? É um mundo que vai a, aquecer mais do que 12, 2 graus? Um mundo que provavelmente vai ter 3 graus, que vai ter... Assim, é, a gente está num ponto em que talvez né, a gente precisa ser um pouco mais... Uh, a gente está ferrado, né? para dizer uma palavra bonita. Então, sabe? Yeah. To, to me, it's a little bit... This is a little bit like trying to define, to, to, to define the, the Portuguese word saudade. There's like a thousand definitions of the word saudade. I, so it's like, what I love is acting, just as you were saying, act with joy or just work at it. Bill McKibben, for 30 years, Bill McKibben has been saying, warning, warning, the world's going coming to an end. It's a crisis, go, go, go. And, um, I, when I talk to young people about Bill McKibben, who I've known f since the 80s, I say, listen to him, but also look at his life. He gets up every morning and he works at it. And he's the, similar to the person uh, Ribeirinho, you know? He, he's not hopeful or whatever. I don't know what he is deep down. He's partially a preacher. But he gets up, he does the work. He just do does the work. So I don't think uh, we don't have to have this debate, really. I think it's not a debate. It's just a matter of different perspectives. Um. Eu só acho assim que o que eu estou querendo dizer é que uh, as pessoas que eu mais testemunho lutarem e resistirem, elas dizem que não têm esperança. Então, lidem com isso. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and but there, this is this is, this is like one a, or two a more. theological question. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm fascinating. <laughs> But uh, so um, uh, John Paul II uh, used a phrase that is in Spanish uh, is esperando contra toda esperanza. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, hoping against uh, all hope. But but what I what I want to support is is the is the fact that for the first time in the history of humankind we are going to have a worse world. Our our future generations are going to inherit a worse. Yeah, world yeah. that they that they that the ones the previous generation received and this is a fact and this is what the children are saying they don't have a hope that things will change they will be worse perhaps 
a lot, I mean, a, far, far worse, or a little bit worse, but they would, they would be worse. And this is something that we'll need to listen. Now, the notion of Christian hope, and all, all other religions, is precisely when you are hopeless, when, 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 that's the, when, when you're dead, when nothing is, that's something that you have to take from life, from the life of others, from the life of nature, from the life of your neighbors, to, 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 do, to act in order to not to say, oh, I cannot do anything, because the, the alternative is to switch off. Because there's no hope, I won't do anything. And we would like also the Harvard Business Schools to change. And we would like uh, investment of a big uh, US company. Some the gentleman over there was talking about big companies. Um, well, that could change. Well, I was in Davos early this year. I'm not so sure that they will change. So unless we push really, really hard, uh, they will continue doing business. So I will, I will recover this this the cry of the, of the earth and the cry of the poor, the cry of the young generations to say we don't have hope because we are going to inherit a terrible world. But that doesn't mean that we, they don't have a philosophical or, or, or theological hope. I don't know if that, that helps. But it depends on the, on the experience of the people. If you ask people that experience uh, the shameful institution of slavery, we, we have been taught for generations that you cannot lose hope. <laughs> well, well, it's the way we grew up. Mm -hmm. So, and we have our the standing of hope. So, I think there's. We are, we are like very shy here because we are. This question is more like. We have come to the end of our time. I know there's a desperate question in the back, but also, Davi, I think, has a comment. You can respond to that. Could we, maybe for 30 seconds, because she was so patient, the woman up there, could you just give a very quick, super quick? But I, th I think this is in response yeah. to the children question. The children. This will be very quick. Oh, I know. Just, and then we can end with uh, Davi. It's actually really closely related to the discussion that's happening, but in a slightly different way. I'm, I'm Julie Klinger. I'm a prof professor geographer at Boston University, and I work with um, Davi Kopanawa's relatives in the community of Maturaka. Um, what I'm really, what I'd like to hear from the people we have assembled today, um, from your fascinating diverse backgrounds, is how we deal with violence, right? So we donate to organizations, we get involved in institutions, we go to peaceful protests, we do intercultural exchange, yes, we're doing all of that, and yet, violence continues. So, how do we deal with that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> But no, I do think we'll go, we'll, we'll, we can ponder the violence. Yeah. Part two. <laughs> então, eu quero assim explicar como a senhora perguntou como é que cria criança. Então, todo mundo sabe indígena não indígena. Então, é, eu fui criado com minha, minha mãe. Minha mãe, meu pai. É, fui criado sem aula, sem escola. A nossa escola é diferente. A mãe da gente, ele cria primeiro na barriga. É, cria a barriga, cuida. Quando a gente nasce, ele vai cuidando, dá um banho, é, dá comida, fruta, caça. E ensinar, ensinar a, criança, a crescer andar, acompanhar, a criança acompanha a mãe, aonde que a mãe vai, a criança vai também. Posso, as crianças, se fosse homem, a pai também leva para o mato, para ensinar a caçar, ensinar a subir nas árvores, ensinar a correr atrás da caça, e uma menina, uma menina, uma mulher, 
Também a mãe ensina para carregar lenha, ralar madioca, fazer beiju e tudo que a gente, nós, povo indígena de Anomami, costuma diferente. Como o criador Omami, como o criador Omami ensinou para nós, continua ensinando no mesmo caminho. É o mesmo caminho que o criador Omami deixou para a gente seguir. Não é para seguir o caminho do branco. Isso é de vocês. A nossa conhecimento, sabedoria é, nativo origi originário, onde nós nascemos. E as crianças, eles seguem para buscar água. Quando mãe manda, ela vai obedecer. E também... É, vai atrás para roçado, para com, buscar comida. Comida não fica em casa, não. a nossa comida fica no roçado, fica na terra, protegendo. É assim que nós, eu fui criado. A minha mãe me cuidou, bem cuidado. A minha mãe nunca me pateu. Nunca assim, é, nunca me mandou reforçado. A mãe da gente era responsabilidade. A mulher é mais responsabilidade que homem. Vocês também têm. E a, a pai, ele cuida de comida. Caçar. Caçar longe, 50 quilômetros. Porque caça não fica assim, terreiro não. Caça fica longe. <risos> caça que, que, é, é, que a natureza cria. Ele não tem chiqueiro, mas ele anda livre. Então, o caçador que vai andar longe para buscar comida para as crianças para poder comer. Sem comida, as nossas crianças ficam com fome, começam a emagrecer. Então, a cultura Yanomami funciona assim. A cultura Yanomami é, cuida a criança direitinho. Outro, a criança, assim, fica brabo. É como vocês têm, vocês têm um filho brabo, né? Então, é assim que eu fui criado. A aldeia, o Atorik, essas três parentes estão aí, escutando. Ela já conhece a minha casa. Guilherme já conhece a minha casa. Ele já conhece como a criança... Cuidado nas comunidades. E a mãe da gente, da, a, a, a criança, a mãe cuida para tomar banho, para não ficar, para não morrer afogado. Cuida para o mato, o cobra não morder. A pai leva ele para ensinar a caçar, ensinar a flechar. E é assim que a mundo já não me funciona. Continua, não mudou nada. A nossos filhos, homem, mulher, adulto, continua, é, continua usando a nossa, nossa costume próprio. Esse ano não mudou nada. Ensinar a falar também, ensinar a falar, cantar, se pintar. Todo mundo fica alegre. Para todo mundo ficar alegre, todo mundo contente. 
e redor o nosso mundo está tá muito, uh, uh, muito ruim para nós. Nós, a liderança, o pajé, ele é muita responsabilidade. Ele fala para as crianças, para as mulheres, para não ficar preocupado. Para homem branco estar tá fazendo muito ruim para nós. Tem três países. Brasil, Venezuela, Colômbia, Equador e a uh, Cuiana Inglês. Como eu falei, o povo está crescendo, então ele está ele tá cercando de nós. Mas nós somos pouco, continua alegre. Continua alegre. Confiando no nosso Criador Omar. O Criador nosso Omar está no nosso lado. É por isso que é, nós estamos enfrentando isso. Então a, nossa, a, a felicidade vai, comer, vai continuar. Como a criou. Não mudou nada. Tá? Então nós estamos só preocupados que é, o capitalista, eles são fome da terra. Eles são fome de tirar mais madeira. Eles são fome de é, cavar buraco como tatu, tirar ouro, diamante, nióbio. Hoje o mundo inteiro... Os governos ali, aliados do mundo, eles estão de olho grande para tirar neópio na território no mame, território indígena. Então, essa é a nossa preocupa. Mas a liderança a aldeia fala, não pode ser preocupado, não. Eles, a povo da cidade, eles estão mais preocupados porque dívida eles têm também. Homem da cidade, ele está rico, mas ele tem uma preocupação. Ele tem um problema. Problema do país, problema do político. Eles estão... É, homem, é, homem da cidade, eles não estão felizes. Eles não estão contentes. E nós, as crianças... Territorial no mami, mas eles estão felizes, porque a natureza está cuidando. A natureza é forte, não é forte de dinheiro. A natureza é forte de alegria, de saúde, e é trazendo a chuva, trazendo riqueza para a gente comer. Para nós, criança e a mami, gente. E a nomeia, mulher, não precisa usar dinheiro. O povo de Anomami viveu sem dinheiro. Agora hoje está, nós estamos se contaminando. Dinheiro é uma. É uma. É como. Como purga. Você conhece purga? Purga que entra na sua pé? Fica doente, pois, pano. Então, é, a, a, a dinheiro é uma. É, estraga a nossa pensamento. Dinheiro é manipula de nós. Então, as doenças estão chegando lá. Então, a nossa criança está protegida. É por isso que eu estou aqui. A minha luta não vai parar. Só a luta vai parar, meu. Quando morrer tudo, Yanomami, sobrou um meu filho, aí a luta vai parar. Mas outra geração vai continuar. Tá vendo? Well, Bruno, eu acho que nós estamos lá. At the beginning of acting, right? Can, maybe you can take us to the next step. Are we done here? I think so. That was great. What a good panel. I took a ton of notes.
I'll be writing something about this. I hope you all have ideas fest festering in your heads, whether or not you have hope. Um, you can still act. Uh, this one thing, I, I am, this is all communication, you know, to me. What we're doing here, this is streaming, right, on the web. It's communicating to other people. The, the Vatican, when, when the Pope did his encyclical, there was, a, I wrote on my Dot Earth blog at the Times, this section, the, the encyclical was on social media. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I didn't, it's buried in there, you know, with everything else. But then I was Googling, and do, do you know that there was this, in the Vatican, in 1971, there was a second Vatican Council decree on the means of social communication. Do you know about this? I didn't know about this. So it, like in 1971, wise souls at the Vatican said, the, the media of social communication can contribute a great deal to human, human unity. This is 1971. If, however, men's minds and hearts are ill disposed, if goodwill is not there, this outpouring of technology may produce an opposite effect, so that there's less understanding and more discord, and as a result, evils are multiplied. Too often we have to watch social communications used to contradict or corrupt the fundamental values of human life. So when Bolsonaro was winning his election by saying beef bullets Bible, he, no one, who, who, who can, there's a job to do and working to use these tools to make the world better. With or without hope, it's, there's stuff to do today, tomorrow, tonight, uh, and kids can do that. They know this stuff better than anybody. So um, that was a really amazing message from 1971 that I stumbled on. So. Thanks, Vatican. Anyway, thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>